<clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. This is the time and place that has been noticed for the eighth meeting of the Joint Federal Strait Task Force on Electric Transmission to consider the matters that have been posted in the agenda issued on February 13th, 2024, in docket AD 2115. This meeting is on the record, and a transcript will be placed into that docket. The public can listen and observe in the room and online. Any comments by the public can be submitted into the docket through FERC's e-filing system. Please visit the FERC website for more information. Today's discussion will avoid the merits of any pending contested matter, and I will interrupt discussions if we enter that territory. Task force members can address matters raised in pending proceedings generally, but should not speak to the specific merits of a pending contested proceeding. And with that, I'll turn it over to the task force co-chairs, FERC Chairman Willie Phillips, Commissioner Kim Duffley of North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. General Counsel. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this eighth meeting of the Joint Task Force. I have to say I'm thrilled to be here and very excited to talk about this topic today, which is transmission siting. You know, I won't go through the history um, of how we got to where we are today, except for to say that it dates back to the Energy Policy Act of 2005, where what was traditionally carved out as a state responsibility that is transmission siting, there was a very small role set aside for the federal government under very limited circumstances. And we've had many different amendments to that authority, most recently, the Infrastructure Act of 2021. And so here we are, the FERC sits at the precipice, prepared to consider a proposal that would give that authority action. But of course, we cannot do that without hearing from our colleagues, hearing from states. And we know we've heard from you already in comments, and we appreciate those comments. But there's something to be said for sitting around this table and hearing from you directly and face to face. And so with that, I want to say I look forward to hearing from you on what you think the challenges are that FERC should face. What do you view as the lessons learned? And through the many years that the states have done their transmission siting, what FERC needs to know and what we do as we move forward. Um, so with that, I'll stop it right there and turn it over to my co-chair, uh, Commissioner Duffley from North Carolina. So thank you, Chairman Phillips. It's always a pleasure to sit beside you. Um, I look forward to the discussion today where we will hear the various state perspectives regarding DOE's new national corridor designation process, as well as how FERC's backstop siting authorities should be implemented. As always, it's my hope uh, that through this process, all participants have a deeper understanding of any concerns expressed or ideas or solutions proposed today. Um, the composition of the N10 has changed since our last meeting. Unfortunately, former President Joe Fiordaliso of the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities passed away unexpectedly last year. He was a strong voice and a dedicated public servant, and we will miss him. If we could have a moment of silence for President Fiordaliso. Thank you. Vice Chair Kimberly Barrow from the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission has been appointed as the second representative from the MACRA region. I'd also like to thank former Chairman Thad LaVar for his commitment to see the task force succeed and for well representing the Western Conference. 
Chairman Mary Throne from Wyoming Public Service Commission has been appointed to fill his seat. Welcome to you both. I'd like to turn it over to them for some brief remarks, beginning with Vice Chair Barrow. Thank you, Chair Duffley. Thank you, Chair Phillips and Commissioner Clements. It's on, I think. It is on. Okay. Thank you. My name is Kim Barrow. I'm the vice chairman of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. Um, I am new to the task force. However, I did support Chairman Dutral in her role on the task force previously, and I look forward to continuing her work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Chairman Throne. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Duffley, and thank you, Chairman Phillips, for the warm welcome, and always good to see Commissioner Clements. Um, I am Mary Throne. Uh, I've been the chairman of the Wyoming Public Service Commission for about a year and serving on the commission since uh, 2019. I come to this work uh, with a long career in uh, Wyoming legislature and then a professional career in environmental law. So I think... Uh, I can get into the micro, and I, but I prefer to be in, in the big picture. And I think that's a, a challenge all of us face in this very technical, detailed work that we do to, to stay on top of uh, how what we do fits in uh, with you know, the rest of the world. I'm happy to be here on behalf of the Western Conference. Uh, appreciate the work of Chair LeVar and uh, former Commissioner Chris Raper. Um, have, don't know that I can fill their shoes, but I certainly look forward to trying. We have a lot happening in the West, as I believe all of you know. Uh, we have a Krepsi Transmission Collaborative. Uh, the utilities through the Western Power Pool are doing their own transmission planning effort. Uh, and then uh, we don't always agree in the West, but we get along and we work hard to uh, disagree without being disagreeable. And so now you have the most populous state in the country and the least populous state in the country on the task force for the West. Well, thank you. So I was gonna just very quickly go over the agenda, mainly to have the audience understand what they're about to uh, witness over the next few hours. Our agendas, our topics are picked. Um, over numerous months, subtopics, and then we develop discussion questions um, that are uh, vetted between the staffs and all of the task force members. So I want to give you a sense then, I want to go over our um, three, only three ground rules uh, for the task force, and then we'll just get right going. So um, today's meeting on siting has uh, four parts. The first part we're going to be talking about existing siting challenges, and that will have two subparts. We'll hear from, from each of the region about what regions about what the siting challenges are within those regions, um, and then we're going to do a special drill down into um, siting challenges around transmission for offshore wind. Um, well, then the next part we'll be talking about the uh, NITSI de designation process. We'll have a presentation actually from uh, DOE on that. Um, we'll then allow the task force members to ask uh, DOE some questions and make some questions and observations. And then we're gonna provide feedback to DOE on, on two, uh, two related topics. We'll take a break at that point. It should be around 3.05 um, for the break. Uh, and then we'll come back and we're going to have a detailed uh, interactive conversation um, on federal state siting processes and uh, NITSI uh, for a little over an hour. And then the last part we'll have talk about wrap up and, um, and next steps. So with that, our um, three ground rules. Number one, if you want to speak. Put your tent card up and I'll keep a cue um, and use my discretion if obviously if somebody has a hot uh, response to somebody that can't wait, but um, we'll do that. Second thing is um, just leave your mics on um, so we don't spend time turning them off, on and off, figuring 
we'll see how that works. Some of you have active green lights, some of you don't. So they're all on right now, so leave them alone. Um, and the third thing is, um, uh, I think you heard when we were going around, we have on the task force from the states, we have two representatives from each of the five regions uh, in the United States. And we ask you, even though you're representing your region, we also welcome you sharing um, your own personal views and views from within your state. Just if you can be clear sometimes when you're offering a regional perspective versus uh, your own personal state's perspective, that would be helpful. And so um, with that, we are gonna launch into the first, um, the first section. I'm gonna read the discussion questions because although the task force members have seen them, the audience have not, just to keep uh, everybody uh, oriented. So as I mentioned, the, we're gonna talk about existing siting charge uh, challenges. We're gonna hear first from each region, take any additional uh, comments, and then we'll move on to a little drill down into offshore wind. So the first question is, how do existing transmission siting challenges compare among uh, regions? For example, the state siting authority uh, versus local government permitting, specific challenges with say federal lands, and how are they similar and uh, different? And so we're going to, uh, we'll start with Commissioner French. Thank you. So the, am I on? Yes, you're on. The, uh, the question was about challenges. Um, and I started thinking about all of uh, my challenges that I personally have faced. But then I, I thought maybe it's best to step back and point out that Kansas and many states have actually had great success uh, working with developers and landowners um, to site lines. It's, it's not all about um, the failures. Um, in Kansas, we have a comprehensive statutory framework, which requires us to evaluate the reasonableness of the proposed location of the line and the need for the line. And we're directed to take into account the benefits to both in-state and out-of-state consumers. Um, and we're also to consider the economic development benefits of the, of the line when we're deciding whether to grant or withhold a permit. And importantly, our statute requires us to act within 120 days, which is a pretty tight turnaround, but we've never missed it. Um, the applications we've seen have come from uh, utility plan. So I've been told that they're testing the system, but we don't have to do anything. All right, we're already in the event of a real fire. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the applications that have come before us in Kansas um, have been utility planned infrastructure. Um, they've been RTO planned backbone transmission lines, and we've even seen a merchant high voltage DC line. And since Congress first established FERC's Backstop Siting Authority in 2005, um, we have received six applications to site major transmission lines in Kansas, and we have um, processed every one of those. Um, they've all gained approval, albeit with some, some conditions, but we've been able to process them all within 120 days for each. Um, I would say our success is greatly aided by the fact that most of those lines do come through our RTO planning process, which provides detailed support and background on the need for the line in the context of both our state and the larger region. Uh, we certainly do not rubber stamp that evidence, but it's often the best evidence, and it comes from an independent not-for-profit source, and it was subjected to substantial stakeholder scrutiny before a siting permit ever got dropped on our desks. But with all of that success in mind, um, and even though I believe my agency and our state has done our job to responsibly site needed transmission, I will acknowledge that siting infrastructure is becoming increasingly less palatable to landowners and much more politically polarizing. 
Landowners are increasingly object objecting to shifts in land use where energy development may be supplanting existing land uses, like farming and ranching, in my case. Uh, and electric transmission is increasingly seen as part of that debate. We're also seeing much more opposition to a finding that the infrastructure is needed. Remember that I said my statute requires us to make a determination of need before granting a permit and granting the eminent domain rights that come along with that. So for states like Kansas uh, and many states within my central region that sit on more uh, excess clean energy than they can use most of the time, more and more lines are being built to uh, and identified to relieve congestion and more efficiently move low cost energy away from where it's harvested. And more and more, um, as energy becomes exported, there's at least a perception that Kansas land is increasingly being used to benefit faraway customers in other states to satisfy their policy goals. Again, that's partially perception. Um, as our country looks to move to cleaner energy sources, I think there may need to be some intense conversations about whether reliability and economic development benefits of new transmission in resource-rich areas um, like where I live and other states surrounding us, um, whether those benefits are an acceptable trade-off for the use of the land to site transmission. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, um, Vice Chair Powell. Thank you. Um, I'll start with Pennsylvania first. So our regs for siting transmission lines apply to overhead lines that are 100 kV and above. And it's interesting that we specify overhead lines. Um, uh, so a full siting application that would result in a certificate of public convenience if we find that it is necessary and proper for the service accommodation, convenience, or safety of the public um, has to be filed for, for those kinds of lines. But frankly, the vast majority of the siting that you see in Pennsylvania is for below 100 kV, and it's not subject to, to PUC review. We also have an abbreviated notification process. It's a letter of notification for projects that fall into the wreck and rebuild category. Um, and if a project needs eminent domain, the, the PUC will conduct a need assessment. Um, with regard to the part of the question about local permitting issues or federal permitting issues, um, we're not getting reports from our companies about federal, and I wouldn't expect that because we have about 2% of our land is federal land. Um, for local issues, we're also not getting um, uh, reports on that, and that's primarily due to an exemption in our in our state law from the municipal planning code. Um, as long as the PUC finds that there's a need for for the line, um, there's an exemption from the the municipal code. Um, that's Pennsylvania. Now for the mid-Atlantic region or or kind of like the overlay with the OPSI states. Um, lots of different laws, of course, um, and a, a mix of rules. But I do see running throughout the states, the vast majority have a, a need requirement in their in their siting rules. Um, but when the need for a, um, a PUC review kicks in is different for all the different states. It's at different voltage levels, starting at 69, going up. Um, and also just depending on, on, on the state, how much federal land they have, what the state of their municipal planning code or whatever you call it in that state is, they do have different challenges. And um, so there's no one size fits all, I feel, for, for the region. Um, I do, I wanna, I wanna comment on um, what everyone's talking about more recently and that's offshore wind, but I'll, I'll raise my card for the, for the next one. Great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, moving now to the Northeast, Commissioner Allen. Good. I'll, I'll, um, I'll uh, take my cue from uh, Chair French and Vice Chair uh, Barrows and uh, talk briefly about the estate experience and then talk about the uh, regional experience. Um, and all my comments are, are really re representing just my, my views of uh, the, the state and, and the region. Um, First, with with the state, I um, the state of Vermont has had you know I, I've a commissioner now, but I was a staffer for many years, so I have three and a half decades of experience. And in that time, there have been uh, probably four major projects that have uh, come through Vermont. I mean, major. I mean, projects that involve essentially new new corridors and the like. And we've been able to uh, cite those um, in the range of 13 to, to 20 months. So I think there's certainly room for improvement. I think part of the longer time frames are associated with the relative uh, infrequent nature of, of these lines. But I think there's room for improvement. I think backstop authority will certainly uh, you know, add some life to uh, the timeliness of, uh, of these things going forward. From a regional perspective, there are um, we have six new uh, New England states. Um, they all have a central siting board, or the commission is the uh, the siting authority. There is at least one state that has a fairly distributed, or um, you know, depends more on the municipalities and communities in the siting process. Um, but I think that that's actually changing. I know there's legislation in that state that is kind of revisiting uh, their, their framework because I think that does add some uh, some time and challenges to the the process. And the over twenty years that, uh, or at least the last twenty years, we've we've built an awful lot of uh, transmission in New England. I think it's in the neighborhood of eleven to. $12 billion, that's a significant step up in the level of investment that has occurred uh, historically. And um, if, if projects have gone through the siting process, the regional siting, or I'm sorry, planning process, they have been cited. Uh, the, 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 the states, the state siting has, authority has worked and has worked well in conjunction with the region, with ISO New England and the capable planning and then support framework that they provide to, uh, to the states. Um, there are a handful of outliers, but those outliers represent states' uh, projects that get reconfigured along the way in sensible ways. I mean, the process is working. Uh, we're undergrounding where we need to underground. Sometimes, you know, the project, uh, isn't um, yeah there, there's room for improvement um, but uh, in general the the um, cooperation between the planning process ISO New England and the states has has been very good um, <clears throat> a few of these may take a little bit longer merchant projects have had a I'd say a, a slightly bumpier ride in, in Vermont uh, you know we have a project that has been approved that's uh, a merchant project that hasn't been built but it it was reviewed in uh, roughly a 13 month uh, time frame uh, there are other projects that have moved forward been approved by the siting authority the uh, the commission uh, in in Maine but there there were other wrinkles there was a referendum and other challenges that kind of slowed progress but ultimately the court process kind of worked and those are finding their, their way forward um there's a reason for that at least as it relates to kind of federal permits and uh tribal uh, lands we have few in in the region a few tribes and uh the uh, tri federally recognized tribal uh um uh, tribes that exist don't uh, most of them don't have actual uh, uh, territories that are associated with their, their tribes. The federal lands, I think, uh, similar to Vice Chair Bar Barrow's comments, less than 2%, actually less than 1.5% one, one of the region. The outlier there is Vermont and uh, New Hampshire, you know, 7% and maybe 13 or 14%, but it doesn't seem to be much of a factor in the, the siting of our, our, um, our projects. Um, yeah, I'll just add one more comment that um, uh, we, we we do have, you know, uh, as I indicated, good cooperation uh, with ISO New England. 
they've been doing some very forward looking uh, thinking about transmission planning. They've identified essentially, uh, or they've done, a, I think, a very holistic and long term view out to 2050. There's a project called Transmission 2050, uh, where they've they've done a rough. Uh, they've roughed out essentially the transmission needs of the, of the system uh, going forward. And what they've found is that really most of the projects on a forward looking uh, basis aren't and don't require new corridors. They can be built along uh, existing corridors. And I think that's uh, good news. There's a lot of transmission that would have to be built, but building up along existing corridors is, uh, is a positive. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving out west, Commissioner Hauk. Thank you. And I'm going to first primarily discuss California, but I will also talk about regional issues as well. Um, in California, we frequently see, um, and I'll focus on complications and um, challenges, but do agree with Chair French that there's also opportunities and we've had some successes as well. Um, in California, we frequently see complications when working with federal land management agencies. This generally relates to coordinating joint environmental document processes to comply with both the National Environmental Policy Act and the California Environmental Quality Act. And as you all know, there's large swaths of federal land throughout the West. So that's a challenge, I think, regionally that, that um, many states in the West are looking at is how to coordinate depending on their environmental review processes with the federal government on the various um, requirements that may match up or may not. Um, we also often see delays in the completion of supporting technical studies related to federal agency study permitting, such as federal agency approval um, power over archaeological studies pursuant to the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, and or the Forest Management Act, and it will depend on the various agencies and what study type is needed depending on where the, the lines are, are being cited. Um, and again, many Western states face these challenges. We um, also have been working to improve our um, tribal consultation processes and meet with tribes earlier and more often. There's cultural resource impact issues that come into play when um, citing transmission lines in the West. In California, um, the law grants the Public Utilities Commission exclusive authority over transmission siting, which preempts the local government permitting authorities. Um, however, the local governments are still very involved in the process and are frequently parties in our siting proceedings, which in California, we sort of have a two-prong approach. We do an environmental review process under our California Environmental Policy Act in coordination with federal agencies that's done in a more traditional administrative process. And then we have um, the rate setting side of it that looks at the um, CPCN, which is an adjudicatory process with a judge and parties. So the process can be complex and um, involves many stakeholders. Um, and again, we also, like was mentioned by my colleagues, have to make findings of need and that the costs are just and reasonable. Another challenge to timely siting of transmission comes from substantial community opposition um, to applicant proposals and or alternatives to the proposals. Um, this can result in public comments that will set the groundwork for legal challenges, which the PUC is required to respond to both through our process and um, if challenged in court. Legal challenges in California to our decisions go directly to the Court of Appeal or the California Supreme Court, which does streamline legal review um, for the siting of, of projects um, in California. Another growing trend is the frequent um, delay in filing of applications for transmission siting by some of the investor-owned utilities, um, and this can be due to um, claims of reprioritization or lack of capital, and this can result in missing um, the California Independent System Operator, our uh, California's Grid Operator's planned in-service dates for transmission system improvements, which um, again can cause um, delays. And like many other states with environmental analysis, completing our Environmental Quality Act analysis process, um, this is required prior to issuing siting decisions and it can be delayed if the project changes. And that may change due to stakeholder input 
for other reasons, and these changes frequently require substantive revision by our commission staff, recirculation of environmental analysis documents for public comments. Mm -hmm. um, and many Western states, particularly Western states with clean energy goals are also, you know, we're looking for transmission solutions throughout the West, especially as we're looking at more incremental power and um, the need to provide support across the region as we increasingly see more extreme weather swings with climate change, both um, creating energy needs and um, looking to coordinate across the West. And as Chair Throne mentioned, there's lots of processes going on in the West to look at how we're going to address interregional transmission issues. So we are we are looking at, at many things and agree again, agree with um, Chair French that despite these challenges, we do have a comprehensive and robust process and um, it provides opportunity for um, important stakeholder involvement and does allow us to move projects forward. And again, as uh, Vice Chair Barrows mentioned, in California, a majority of our projects are not reviewed by the commission. Um, they're wreck and rebuild projects that um, come directly here to all of you. And so um, I want to um, just recognize that as well, but these are um, some of the major challenges that, that we're seeing in the West and we'll end there. Thank you very much. So um, moving to the Southeast, Commissioner Cranmore. Thank you. So I'm from one of the fastest growing states in the nation and one of the fastest growing regions in the country as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Georgia and then I'm also gonna uh, talk a little bit about the region you'll understand. Um, but let me first table set. So in Georgia, we operate in a shared environment with shared operations and transmission. One major investor in utility, 41 electric co-ops, and 49 municipal electric providers. The shared system provides a great economy of scale and cost savings to customers. Much of our electric generation is mutually owned, and our transmission is interconnected without costly redundancy across com companies. Our region is directly interconnected to five neighboring regions. So my comments today will reflect the transmission permitting and siting realities in Georgia, as well as attempt to provide a general picture of the Southeast overall. With the caveat though, that each state is different even within our region. The intensely local and regional differences are of course, what makes one size all transmission policies very challenging. Many areas of the country are experiencing significant challenges siting and permitting transmission lines. Recently, I testified in a congressional hearing and one of my colleagues, Commissioner Nick Myers from Arizona, reflected on the delays that have plagued the Sunzia transmission project in Arizona, New Mexico. Though the reasons for delay vary by state. The source of those challenges is usually either because of the difficulty building transmission over federal lands, which are plentiful out west in particular, or perhaps due to localized challenges to eminent domain authority, legal challenges to environmental permits, disagreements over cost allocation, or over state energy and climate prerogatives, or a multi-layered transmission planning process with multiple responsible entities. There are also significant interconnection queue delays in many of these areas, which can exacerbate transmission planning and therefore permitting and siting overall. Fortunately for the Southeast, the majority of which is vertically integrated and state regulated, we generally do not face these similar challenges and delays when it comes to building the right types of transmission for customers. Generally speaking in the Southeast, including Georgia, State environmental agencies have not unnecessarily delayed permits that are needed for the construction and development and maintenance. This is a very good thing because as many parts of our region and certainly in the case of Georgia, we're anticipating significant load growth, which will require continued transmission build out as the region continues to transition its overall resource mix. It might be helpful to pause and note a few things about the market structure that's present in the majority of the Southeast. First, general transmission siting authority is reserved to the states under the Federal Power Act, and the majority of state commissions in the Southeast have maintained a significant jurisdictional role over the planning and oversight of transmission. State commissions regularly regulate public utilities, their retail rates, integrated resource planning processes. The practical effect is that transmission does not get built unless the state commissions think that the facility is needed and the cost to retail customers are reasonable. Most of the transmission in the Southeast is carefully planned as part of a holistic IRP process 
that the utilities in the state undertake in regular cycles under the purview of the state commissions. This process has resulted in a robust, resilient transmission system for the region, which is a total benefit of transmission overall, reliability, economic, public policy benefits, they're all accounted for in this process. But transmission planning doesn't stop there. Most states in the Southeast are sponsors of the Southeast Regional Transmission Planning Process, SORTEP. As part of this process, each utility brings their transmission plans to be compiled into the larger transmission, uh, SORTEP Transmission Expansion Plan. The goal is to ensure those plans both meet the needs of customers, satisfy individual IRP requirements, and each company's open access transmission tariff on file at the FERC. To ensure that the regional plans do not negatively impact each other or the Eastern interconnect at large. If they do, those problems are addressed. And also through CERTA, further studies are performed to see if there are any transmission needs that can be more effectively or efficiently satisfied by alternative means or plans. These alternatives can either be transmission or non-wires, and further stakeholders have a direct opportunity to participate to and can suggest a better alternative and or submit a project for cost allocation. Though there are some differences in timelines and processes in southeastern states, once a transmission need is identified through the IRP process, state regulatory approval is then sought from the commission in the states. During this time, utility companies are also acquiring land, compensating landowners, addressing any landowner issues along the transmission rights of way. In Georgia, utilities also go through a siting process to establish specific routes. During this time, communities are engaged, public meetings are held, and feedback is gathered and incorporated into those plans. In Georgia and in many southeastern states, utilities also have eminent domain authority where landowners can receive just compensation under law. That said, in Georgia, that authority is only exercised less than 1% of the time. And then at this point, after this efficient yet intentional process, construction can commence. We look to CERTEP as a proxy for the transmission success of the region under this regulatory framework. As of 2022, and measured in terms of sheer mileage of transmission lines alone, CERTEP's 83,110 linear miles of transmission exceeds that of CAISO at 26,000 miles, MISO of 72,000 miles, New England ISO of 9,000 miles, New York ISO of 11,000 miles, and SPP of 70,000 miles. But it's also roughly equivalent to PJM's 84,000 miles. Further, the CERTEP sponsors are continuing to proactively expand their collective grid with data demonstrating that between the years of 2015 and 2020, the CERTEP sponsors added 3,158 miles of new transmission lines and 6,989 miles of upgrades. This does not even include for transmission that's being built by non sirtep companies. The Southeastern region's IRP RFP driven transmission planning process thus are continuing to add a robust grid as measured in absolute terms of steel in the ground. Indeed, over the 10 year period from 2012 to 2021, the CERTEP sponsors alone added approximately $20 billion in new transmission investment. That said, I want to be clear, though, that trans transmission build takes time, and it takes time in our region. But that is because most of all from normal construction timelines for transmission development that, that would be present in any region. These are major construction projects. They simply take time to build. For example, after determining a need, the average for a 50-mile 500 kV line can take plus seven plus years. The 230 kV line can take five to seven years, and 115 kV line can take three to five years. The Southeast, along with the rest of the country, is also seeing supply chain constraints that will likely percent, persist as the energy transition continues, which adds to construction delays. Finally, changes to federal policies that remove barriers to transmission development experienced in other parts of the country, such as permitting challenges on federal lands, definitely makes sense to pursue. That said, from the vantage point of the Southeast, we must also ensure that those changes do not upend processes that are working so well. Processes that result in the right kind of transmission being built for customers after steady, long-term, holistic planning under the regulatory oversight of the state commissions.
So thank you all for your thoughtful remarks from each region. I think what we've heard is that um, that even though each state has their own uh, authorities around siting of transmission, that um, that there's a general feeling that overall things are still working fairly robustly and comprehensively, not all the time, but in general, and that when there's either an RTO process helping to establish need or a state IRP process, that's helpful, although states still have to determine that that's, uh, that that's workable. Um, the challenges um, that maybe we're seeing and are starting to increase um, sounds like happen when there's uh, merchant transmission, when there are federal uh, lands or permits that are involved, um, when there's uh, when you're passing through a state or a region, and there is a sense in that state that although there are benefits to the state, a lot of the benefits are going out of the state or region, and that's probably going to be a growing uh, a growing um, issue. And then, um, and I think related to that is increasing amount of community opposition in those, in those uh, situations. And I think we have examples of that in every region. So before we go on, I would just want to know if any of the task force members that haven't said anything about this want to just add a little bit, and then we'll move on. OK. Chair Thorne. Um, thank you. I just wanted to add just a, a quick timeline for a large transmission project in Wyoming to give you flavor of the federal role. Um, the Gateway South project, the Rocky Mountain Power Pacific Corps large gateway transmission project, I believe was first proposed in 2007. And uh, Gateway South uh, just initiated construction, I think last year. So it it was more of a 15 year time frame, maybe 20 from conception to reality. And the bulk of that delay was due to federal land policy issues, not the state siting processes. So it, it can be extensive. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so now we're gonna move into a new area which is around transmission for offshore wind. We have, as of a few weeks ago, the first large scale, beginning of the first large scale offshore wind off of New England um, coming into the grid. We now have uh, leases out on the West Coast and we have interest in the Great Lakes for offshore wind. So we're gonna hear from a few commissioners um, on this emerging issue. And the question is, what unique siting challenges does offshore wind present, including coordination among multiple entities, siting of regional and interregional inter transmission needed to enable offshore wind, and how best to identify and prioritize injection points? So we'll start uh, with Commissioner Howard. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, as many of you know, New York has a very bold and aggressive goals in the offshore wind space. In fact, we are very proud as, as we speak, one of our first offshore wind projects are supplying electricity to the New York grid. We also have, I believe the first order 1000 pro approved project by our New York ISO to coordinate, uh, to design to integrate offshore wind into our state's grid. We currently have a 9,000 megawatt legislative mandate in our state uh, to be, be done. However, projected planners on what we need to fully decarbonize our state will put our need for offshore wind in the future in excess of 20,000 megawatts. And I now believe now, I personally believe now is the time for multi-state and multi-ISO coordination at a high 
and uh, accelerated pace. I am gratified that 10 states are collaborating, a collaborative is underway on this issue. But I firmly believe that the federal government needs to take this issue of offshore wind under its wing and lead the various coastal states. The current radio connection protocol of is will soon be overwhelmed, uh, including the issue of some very unique things in New York dealing with the Verrazano Narrows and potentially the best way into New York City isn't always through New York State. Now is the time to begin this planning for this multi-ISO mesh network. Uh, it, we may already be behind. The complex engineering and uh, economics protocols are going to be quite difficult, but now is the time to do it while we still have some headroom and time before we meet individual state and national mandates. And I would pose the question to this group and to FERC, is it time to acknowledge that the Atlantic Ocean may be a national interest corridor in and of itself? And that is something that we should come to grips with very quickly. Remember, particularly the ISO New York, New England, and the PJM system never contemplated, never contemplated large offshore wind generation and integration. So while the lines may be somewhat arbitrary and capricious today, they certainly weren't 25 years ago when the ISOs were formed. But again, I don't believe that the states alone will be able to find the individual leadership necessary to move this process forward. And uh, both from DOE and FERC, I strongly believe that uh, that leadership is necessary. Thank you. I'm going to go to Commissioner Scripps, then Commissioner Allen, then Commissioner. I go next. Yeah. All right. I think this is on. Um, so I um, come to you from the Great Lakes State, and uh, I will say to start that I have absolutely no idea when we'll have offshore wind in the Great Lakes. Um, but I do think it's more of a question of when than if. Uh, we saw a fair amount of activity back in the 2009 and 10 timeframe with a number of states investigating it. It's largely been on hold for, for a decade or more. Um, but you saw we've seen recent legislative discussions in Illinois, a study in New York on uh, their parts of Lakes Erie and Ontario, uh, and some additional discussion uh, sort of throughout the region. I think some of the same challenges that Commissioner Howard outlined are the same, uh, including uh, the coordination between three RTOs, uh, the New York ISO, PJM, and MISO, plus the Ontario Independent Electric System Operator. Uh, and then there are, of course, some unique challenges to the Great Lakes, most particularly ice. Uh, if we ever see ice again, uh, it was 60 degrees at home yesterday, although I am happy to say that my kids are home with a snow day today, so <laughs> things can change fairly quickly. Um, the other piece that I think is is interesting is that siting uh, for the Great Lakes um, is the province of the states, um, and that the the leasing uh, it does not go through the Department of the Interior or the uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, but instead through the states. So that can be both uh, problematic. There are processes to be developed. They may vary across the eight Great Lakes states, but there may also be some advantages, including cost uh, over BOEM uh, authorized lands. So again, I don't know when this will happen, but I do know this. Um, to uh, Commissioner Pridemore's point and 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 others, the, the timelines for transmission development can be long. And we've seen that in MISO as well, that uh, the long range transmission planning process started in August of 2020 with MISO a year after OMS uh, provided some encouragement to, to move down that path. Uh, the first tranche of projects was of course approved in uh, June 2022, and we'll expect some of those first projects to be online in 2028. But when you zoom out from that eight years from project approval, um, or from a process start six years from project approval to when the first projects are energized, it suggests that it's prudent to be prepared. Um, one of my favorite quotes comes from Wayne Gretzky, uh, that you shouldn't skate to where the puck is, you should skate to where the puck is going. Uh, it's thinking like that, that 
earned him the nickname, the great one. And so on Great Lakes offshore wind, I don't know when the puck will arrive, but I think it's uh, important that we get skating. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Allen. Uh, thanks. I'll, I'll try to be brief because I, uh, my comments largely kind of mirror th those of uh, Commissioner uh, Howard's. And I um, think uh, that, uh, you know, I, I, I think it really comes down to issues of uh, coordination between the uh, regional ISOs and uh, the states. Um, uh, um, as uh, Commissioner Howard mentioned, there, there's significant goals in New York, but there's also sig significant uh, goals in uh, New England. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's roughly eight gigawatts of uh, capacity that is being sought offshore among the uh, six uh, states. It's going to be very important for New York and uh, New England to uh, coordinate and uh, collaborate and look for shared opportunities as much as possible. And I think that extends all the way down the seaboard. And I'm, yeah, I'm very pleased that there is, as uh, Commissioner Howard had mentioned, a, a 10 state uh, collaborative. And, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm also, I'm not a part of that, that collaborative. I don't attend those meetings, but I do know the state of, of Vermont, even though we don't have an ocean shoreline, are a part of that and will be impacted by the uh, opportunities uh, that are associated with offshore. When I'm grateful to the grid deployment office and the work, good work they're doing to facilitate and uh, provide information to and otherwise support uh, that uh, 10 state collaborative. I think that's uh, being facilitated by Columbia University. And uh, I, I'm very much appreciative of, of the work that is going on there. In terms of, uh, Injection points, uh, that's a, you know, a critical issue in my mind. We have to find ways to uh, consolidate as best we can those uh, injection points. There are probably different ways to, to do that. I think uh, New Jersey had some success in their efforts to uh, consolidate for ratepayer benefit the, uh, uh, the injection points um, and onshoring of offshore wind. I think it's important that the entire uh, seaboard do the same. Very interested in offshore wind, not only for um, the opportunities of rationalizing the, the various uh, wind projects that are out there and flowing the, the energy from those projects to different parts of the eastern seaboard. Um, but I'm also interested in, frankly, the opportunities for those mesh networks that Commissioner Howard had uh, mentioned and the opportunities for uh, creating new opportunities for interregional connections among the uh, the you know, Eastern Seaboard uh, RTOs and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halk. Um, thank you, and I'll also try and keep my comments short. Um, to give a Western perspective, offshore wind has a tremendous potential to bring much needed clean energy to the West. California and Oregon both have BOEM approved wind energy lease areas off their coast, but there are significant challenges um, to bringing this energy online. Both areas, um, both of the BOEM approved areas will need significant transmission capacity to bring offshore wind to load centers. The lack of interregional transmission planning and development is going to be a very big challenge. The California Energy Commission um, has a draft of an AB 525 strategic plan for offshore wind energy. This is a public document and the Energy Commission plans to hold a public workshop in March, followed by formal consideration at a future um, voting meeting. The strategic plan includes a holistic review of the potential need for port development, workforce training, permitting, and transmission challenges that will need to be successfully um, addressed in order to create new offshore wind. And this will be floating platform indus industry um, off of the West Coast. These projects have a tremendous potential, again, to bring much needed clean energy to the West, while also like all large infrastructure projects pose challenges and potential impacts for localized communities. This includes communities that rely on fishing as primary economic development or for subsistence and tribal nations in California. There's um, eight tribal nations in the North Coast of California that have um, been significantly engaged in this process and have raised cultural resource issues, environmental issues, need for community benefits, 
including access to energy, as um, many of these communities have areas where um, there are homes that are still not connected to the grid and they don't want to be bypassed if this new energy um, opportunity is being brought to the North Coast. So these are challenges that, that we will be addressing as we look at the potential for offshore wind. Thank you. Do other task force members um, have any questions of the ones who've spoken or want to add a few comments of your own about transmission related to offshore wind? Commissioner comments. Thank you. It's nice to see you all. Um, I have two questions, but I'll start with one. And if I don't have time, you can tell me not to ask the second one. Uh, you know, it was, it's great for you to, uh, Commissioner Howard, to explain the potential and, and Commissioner Allen to talk about the multi state effort going on. New England, and I've been really encouraged to be kind of watching the developments there. And I hear you and saying, how are we going to, how do we accelerate that? How do we get there in time to meet the next sets of procurements and beyond if it without kind of the support of the federal government? So I'm interested from the perspective of FERC, do you have any thoughts? Um, uh, uh, and uh, Commissioner Howard, Commissioner Allen, or others on how FERC might help to accelerate the good work of the multi-state collaborative that's going on uh, with the work of the relative and RTOs that presumably has to get involved or is is already involved and and, and could, could work together. Commissioner Howard? Having been in government for over 40 years, collaboration only works to a greater extent. And as uh, we have seen with the issues of the uh, national corridors of interest and the need potentially to say it's time to stop talking and start doing, I think we will rapidly approach this. Um, what is particularly unique for those that don't know, if you look at actually where the BOEM maps are and where the actual wind regions are, you would assume that some of our New York regions are actually in New Jersey or Rhode Island because they're actually much closer than those, those places. So, you know, again, we are... We are advantaged because we can see the ocean from my office in New York City. However, uh, getting to my office is quite difficult. And there are, well, particularly in New England, I, I believe there are reasonably uh, a, a high number of injection points, largely from pre-existing fossil and nuclear plants. You know, we didn't. We are not so. Uh, we're not so. Uh, blessed in New York with that. So we were going to need, and we will use up our injection points quite quickly. Uh, but again, uh, you know, we are a single state ISO and we've been proud of that. And we've been able to build a lot of transmission and we are building it today. But when in this space, you know, uh, I do believe the federal government may need to come in and say, Hey guys, we're, we're on top of this. And, we need to take a much more aggressive role. Commissioner Howard, you had said in your opening remarks that, that maybe this offshore wind corridor should be considered for a NITSI, in which case FERC would have backstop authority. Is that, is that yeah, what? Yeah, I, I think- I, I think that's what Commissioner Clements- I think the issue is, is which is different than this is, this is not a land use issue. This is an economic issue. While those states that- uh, May or may not pass the no losers test, i.e., Kansas. This is this will have very little impact on terrestrial life, but it could have a major impact on how the economic viability and reducing the cost and the efficiencies of all our offshore plans. Mr. Allen, you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I, I think you know on the state side, there's plenty of motivation to kind of uh, move forward on uh, when, which is a uh, positive. I think, uh, you know, the uh, Department of Energy and perhaps FERC can uh, use their devices to help kind of further encourage that that coordination, send, you know, strong signals that uh, special deference or relief or uh, consideration will be given when projects are vetted through uh, or cost allocation frameworks are identified and other um, other um, uh, transmission pathways are developed and uh, coordinated, especially through the regional uh, um, planning efforts, the RTOs, but um, also th uh, vetted through the multi-RTO 
efforts and then these uh, state collaboratives. So I think, uh, you know, I, uh, the grid deployment office I mentioned is uh, making some sort. I think there might be a uh, need for more money and uh, encouragement on, on their end. But I, I do think there are some devices that are available to FERC to send signals that that, that is strongly encouraged, uh, desired, and potentially needed. Commissioner Clintz, go ahead and ask your second question, then we'll move on. Thanks. Uh, more generally, and thinking back to the first set of comments as well as the second, I'm not sure if past is prologue on how long it's going to take to build new transmission. I mean, I think in, on one side, you think about Sun Zia or 10 West, those were started before, you know, the first Obama effort at interagency coordination on the federal lands issues. So it might take less time. And on the other flip side, in areas where things have been successful, like the Southeast, um, the Midwest, if and when FERC finalizes a, a planning rule that facilitates this kind of generational development of transmission, it might get harder and slower. And so I'm not sure if kind of how we've done it is telling to how it's going to go. And I'd be curious to the state regulators, um, have you done any things in the regional level, um, not related to these Western merchant projects, but in the regional level to, to take on this potential challenge that could get worse already? And are you seeing successes that we could learn from? Let's just take one or two, and then we do need to move on. I just want to see if anybody else, in addition to Commissioner Howard, wants to jump in. Yeah, Mr. French, and then we'll come to you. Yeah, I mean, just briefly, I think if I interpreted your comment correctly, I think you've highlighted the fact that just because we've had success um, citing projects in the past, um, we probably shouldn't take that as an automatic, that the future types of projects we're talking about building in the next 10 or 20 years, particularly long-term multi-value projects um, are necessarily going to get cited. And I guess I would completely agree with that. I have concerns while I think that our planning does need to get um, more uh, anticipatory, and it also does need to be more holistic, solving multiple needs. I think as you do those things, it becomes much more difficult to communicate to the public and to landowners um, why your state needs to build um, this project that may be serving lots of different stakeholders. It's not maybe just being built for um, an economic pur purpose to help customers within your state. It's not just being built to support reliability in your state. Um, it's going to probably benefit wider regions and it's going to benefit um, broader sets of stakeholders. It, it may be a reliability project slash economic project slash generator interconnection project. Um, and that the messaging on why that's important to cite is much more difficult. So I don't know that I've uh, provided an answer, but I do think we're all going to have to do better um, staying um, accountable to our ratepayers and landowners within the state um, to make sure we one, understand why we're planning and proposing these projects that will burden the land, um, and then effectively communicating that. And there's a place for all stakeholders to be involved in those communications. So I'm just going to ask, because we're, in theory, supposed to be talking about offshore wind now, and you've opened up a big a big question. <laughs> so if anybody wants to put that within the context of offshore wind, we'll take it. Otherwise, we're a little bit behind time. So Vice Chair. So this is going back to the first question. Um, about challenges seen in the region. And anecdotally, I'm hearing from New Jersey and also um, from Virginia about the increased opposition that they're getting from landowners when it comes to um, offshore wind development. They're hearing from transmission developers that there is an increase in, in uh, challenges. Um, Mind you, um, the so the local authorities in New Jersey, I'm going to circle back around with this, the local authorities in New Jersey are being pressed to be more active in citing transmission. Now, think about uh, being in a local authority's shoes, and they don't hardly know what RTO is, much less what PJM's TAC process is or... Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's permitting process, it's a learning curve. Um, a lot of opposition, I believe, 
could be met head on with education. Um, designing the process so that people who their knee jerk reaction is going to be to oppose it um, so that they can get educated about why this is happening, what the need is. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and, and, you know, right now it's coming up in terms of offshore wind because we've got folks who are not normally participating in this process, participating, um, but I think it's probably a broader issue as well. Yeah. Offshore wind related? Not offshore wind related. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Commissioner Howard then because I ta I tabled him before. So let's go ahead. Just a brief thing to Commissioner Clemency. You know, the first few are gonna be easy. The next twenty are gonna be hard. Short, Commissioner Short. Good morning. <laughs> To Commissioner Clement's second question, which circled back to the original first question. So what we would ask, what we would ask for in the Southeast, if it's going to provide, um, if the FERC does make a decision on a transmission siting rule, it's going to provide additional complexity into the system that for the Southeast is currently working very well. Well, complex, with complexity usually comes cost too. And so, you know, I would just hope that the cost considerations I hope cost would be a consideration of the FERC throughout that process and anything that puts upward pressure on rates. Thank you, everybody. We're going to jump right into DOE's uh, NEATSI designation process. We have Jeffrey Daniels and uh, Gretchen Kershaw. Um, and Gretchen was uh, working with us on this task force earlier before she got stolen away by DOE. So if you two will go ahead and do your presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And good afternoon to the, oh gosh, I get mood lighting. Cool. <laughs> um, uh, good afternoon. Thank you to the task force for inviting us uh, and for inviting a couple of uh, FERC alums to uh, talk to you about uh, the work we're currently doing uh, at the Department of Energy and in the grid deployment office on these issues. Um, I am going to start um, with providing a little bit of an overview of GDO, just so you know uh, kind of who we are and where we're coming from. Um, we'll also um, talk a little bit about one of the items on your agenda was uh, the resources that we have to assist states with siting and permitting challenges. Um, and we have a few items that will be very relevant to the conversation that we just heard. So I'm, I'm looking forward to addressing those. Um, I'm then going to turn it over to Gretchen, who will talk about the the inclusive and iterative phase process that we've developed for designating national interest electric transmission corridors. Uh, or NITSIs, as we will talk about, uh, as we will often refer to them, particularly the the um, priorities and criteria that DOE intends to consider throughout the process. Um, Gretchen will also highlight some findings from our National Transmission Needs Study, uh, which is an incredibly important input to NITSI designation. And then finally, we'll talk some about the interaction between NITSI designation and state and federal siting and permitting. Um, so to jump right in, who are we at the Grid Deployment Office? Um, we are working to uh, provide electricity to everyone, everywhere, by maintaining and investing in critical generation facilities to ensure resource adequacy, improving and expanding transmission and distribution systems to ensure all communities have access to reliable, affordable electricity. We're composed of three divisions. The Generation Credits Division is implementing important uh, programs enacted by Congress and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law uh, to support existing nuclear generation and to support uh, and encourage the upgrading of existing uh, hydroelectric facilities. The Transmission Division that I lead and that we'll talk a lot about the work we do today, um, as well as the Grid Modernization Division, and many of you are familiar with them. They implement uh, grid resilience and innovation partnership programs, as well as state formula grant funding to the states for resilience uh, activities. So that is who we are. Um, let's talk for just a couple of minutes. I want to highlight a few things that we are doing, um, something that, that the task force asks us to do um, in the nature of assisting states um, and, frankly, federal agencies, and I'll talk about that in a minute too, with siting and permitting challenges. This is a multifaceted challenge, as you all 
uh, eloquently talked about, and and we're trying to address these challenges uh, at every place where we find them. So starting first with a grant program that we have that I think goes directly to a lot of the comments that uh, you all raised about engagement with communities and the challenges that you see today and the growing challenges that you are anticipating. In the Inflation Reduction Act, Congress uh, provided the department uh, and uh, GDO's implementing this authority um, a $760 million grant program uh, that does a couple of things. First, it is in, uh, intended to uh, help states strengthen and accelerate their uh, state and local uh, siting and permitting processes. And second, to support economic development opportunities in communities that are impacted by transmission. Um, so siting authorities, um, so whoever the, the ultimate decision maker is in your state, be it uh, one of you on your uh, public utility commission, a state siting authority, uh, local authorities in areas where they have primary um, authority can apply for grants to engage in siting uh, activities. It could be examination of alternate routes, participation in regulatory processes of another entity, which could include another state, uh, or at FERC with regard to cost allocation, uh, or at an RTO with regard to planning. Um, those are just some of the things that we can support with grants in that area. Uh, secondly, on the community economic development side, um, communities that are impacted by transmission can apply to support economic development projects. These are really, uh, these grants are intended to assure that communities are benefiting from transmission that is impacting them. And Congress gave us wide latitude to support community priorities as they are brought to us. So it could be anything from energy related priorities like workforce training, um, development of mitigation measures, um, to just community priorities like community centers, like recreation opportunities. We have a wide array of things that we can do there as well. Um, this, uh, so we issued a first funding opportunity announcement last year and received concept papers. We are now waiting um, uh, full applications um, from folks who submitted concept papers uh, and are working to provide our first round of grants uh, this year, as well as to open uh, with available funding a second round um, at some point this year as well. Um, so let me turn to um, something that we also just talked a lot about, which is coordination of federal agencies. Many of you uh, eloquently raised the importance of this issue. And um, DOE is uniquely focused on this, as is the administration as a whole. Um, the Coordinated Interagency Transmission Authorizations and Permits Program, that is a mouthful. Uh, we call it CITAP. Um, is part is another critical part of our strategy to reduce delays and particularly to reduce delays that are caused when we have multiple federal authorizations that are required. Um, this is actually existing authority in the Federal Power Act under Section 216H that allows DOE to act as lead agency and to set schedules for federal authorizations and um, last May, at the direction of the White House, nine federal agencies entered into a memorandum of understanding um, committing to reinvigorate this authority um, and to um, um, set schedules that would uh, require all federal authorizations and permits to be completed within two years of the issuance of a notice of intent to prepare an environmental impact statement. Uh, for our part at DOE, uh, we committed to update our pre-filing processes um, to uh, strengthen those processes, uh, make them mandatory for transmission developers that want to take advantage of this coordination authority, um, and to strengthen the amount of information that we collect in those processes so that they will best support federal decision making that needs to happen. Um, so in addition to setting schedules, we will also prepare a single environmental impact statement or environmental document that will support all agency decision making on that project. So it's an important opportunity to reduce duplication among agencies uh, who might each be preparing their own documents um, and also to set binding schedules um, to provide certainty to developers and others. One thing I want to emphasize is that while states are not required to participate in this process, states can participate in the site app program, and they can rely on the single federal environmental review document that we prepare 
uh, to um, to support their own needed decision making under their own statutory authorities. And we really hope to see states come in. We've talked to a number of states already who are very interested in taking advantage of this. It's a new resource that we can provide, and it's a way that we can continue to coordinate uh, transmission siting and permitting. Finally, before I turn it over to Gretchen, I do want to um, mention that um, GDO is regularly providing technical assistance to states on a variety of these issues. And some of it you heard about, I appreciate um, Commissioners Howard and, and Alan mentioning our work with the 10 State Northeast Collaborative uh, to work on some of the offshore uh, wind um, issues that, that, that you were raising earlier. Uh, one thing I would mention there is um, we should have drafted Atlantic Offshore Wind Action Plan uh, last year. We're finalizing that action plan now, but the first two primary recommendations align very well with what I heard from Commissioners Howard and Allen, which is the need for uh, multi-state coordination and the need for multi-RTO coordination. And so we're working with the states and with the RTOs to see how we can provide technical assistance and support to those efforts to really try to accelerate them. Um, we're also exploring opportunities and would really like feedback from you all on additional um, technical assistance that would be valuable to you, particularly as states become more and more engaged in planning, as states see more and more value, as Commissioner French talked about, in particular, Chair French, I'm sorry, uh, talked about with regard to relying on the planning process in order um, to help make their siting decisions. Um, I know cost allocation will continue to become a bigger and bigger issue as well. And so um, we would like to talk to you about what kinds of technical assistance uh, would be helpful. Um, and so look forward to that as well. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over um, to Gretchen to, to talk more about the process. Great, thanks Jeff. So I'm gonna jump right in because I know we're behind. And if you've watched the webinar on National Interest Electric Transmission Corridors, it's all there. But I did wanna start just by quickly uh, level setting, what is a National Interest Electric Transmission Corridor or NITSI at a conceptual level, not sort of the legal or statutory definition. And that is that a NITSI is an area of the country where inadequate transmission harms consumers. And that can be currently or looking out into the future. And of course, an area that DOE has designated as a NITSI. And when we talk about consumer harms, it's a really broad concept. It's the type of things that we've been talking about here at the conference all week. We've been talking about today, harms to reliability, harms to resilience, economic harms, and the inability to access clean, diverse, and affordable electricity supply. So in December, DOE released a guidance document that set out the new process that we plan to follow to designate NITSEs. And as you can see here on the slide, it is a four-phase process. And so I'm just going to quickly go over at a high level. Uh, I've been asked to use my super fast talking voice, so I will try to use that as well. Uh, and we can, if anyone has questions, I can dig into more of sort of the details of what happens in each phase. But essentially, phase one was kicked off with the December guidance issuance. It opened a 45-day window for the public to submit to DOE ideas, proposals, where we should consider designating a NITSI and why. And so that closed on February 2nd, and we are now reviewing those proposals, and we are developing what's called a preliminary list of potential NITSIs. And what this is, is a list of uh, those potential NITSIs that we're continuing to consider into phase two. It's a public release document. And there we're going to seek public comment on that list. It will include the preliminary assessment of transmission needs, harms to consumers, sort of the relevant factors from the Federal Power Act that we've considered for these potential NITSIs. And then we will also solicit sort of detailed environmental information and other resource impacts on those NITSIs in that list. And importantly, any potential NITSI that is not on that list is not moving to phase two. At the same time, the potential list, the potential NITSI list in phase two will likely contain NITSIs that do not move to phase three. And so we're sort of increasingly narrowing our scope as we go through and we receive additional public input throughout this process. And the way that we move to phase three is we will prioritize where we have more complete information to facilitate environmental review. So we want to do our environmental review in phase three efficiently. We want to get to NITSI designation as quickly as we can, but we want to also produce environmental documents that are more useful for siting authorities, and that is both at the federal and the state level. And we will also, phase three will be sort of the full NEPA review, robust public engagement on all aspects of NITSI. So there's the NEPA, but there's also the federal power act considerations of transmission need and the harm to consumers and all the 
discretionary factors. And then the fourth phase is where we conclude with our final designation report and our final environmental document. And I do just want to quickly touch on the impact of NITSI designation at this point. Uh, we are, of course, focusing public and policymaker attention on the greatest areas of transmission need. We have identified these in its narrow, increasingly narrow scope of NITSEs as, as key targeted high priority areas. We're also unlocking key federal financing and permitting tools. In the past, the focus was entirely on unlocking FERC's siting and permitting authority. That is still an impact of NITSE designation. But in addition, we now have federal financing tools specific to NITSEs. And one is the uh, direct loan authority under the Inflation Reduction Act Transmission Facility Financing Program. There's also unlocked uh, one of the potential uses for public-private partnerships under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Transmission Facilitation Program is, again, NITSE designation. So as we go through, right, I've mentioned a couple times, we're going to be narrowing the scope from the, the grand entire United States, how do we get down to a specific area of the country that we want to designate as a NITSE? So this slide highlights some of our key considerations that will drive our designation identification of these corridors. Of course, at the top is the presence of pressing transmission needs. We are looking for, for high priority targeted areas consistent with the statute. One of the key inputs to this is the National Transmission Needs Study, our Triennial State of the Grid Report. Uh, we're also looking at other relevant information in the statute sort of opens it up to other relevant information. So we talked about RTOISO planning processes being very robust and independent and, and this sort of value of that information. That's something that we'll be considering as well. Also state policies driving transmission needs. We would love to hear from states on your state policies, how they're driving transmission needs in particular areas of the country. Next is those adverse effects on consumers. Again, really focused on reliability, affordability, things that I think we can, everyone in this room can agree are sort of key considerations when we're looking to where we should build transmission. Then there's a long list of factors in the Federal Power Act, which I will not go through, that DOE may consider, but just highlighting a couple um, we were talking about, right, in, in New York, using existing rights of way, maximizing existing rights of way. That's one of the considerations for DITSE. Uh, minimizing impacts on sensitive environmental resources, also just furthering national energy policy goals. So a lot of sort of broad swaths of considerations. Next, um, whether NITSE designation would promote, promote multi-value, multi-driver transmission planning, that's something we think is really important. So we're going to be looking to where we can promote that. Um, also, we would like to designate NITSEs that are valuable. So we are going to look at the utility of the designation, where we can resolve barriers to transmission deployment within the area that we're looking at for NITSE designation. I mentioned the completeness of information. We want to facilitate our environmental review, so we will be looking for where we have a robust set of information. And then public engagement, and that's come up a number of times today. We know that one of the roadblocks to transmission development is public opposition. We also know that early engagement with communities, with affected stakeholders, is also a key to overcoming those barriers. So we have designed this process to have a lot of public engagement. We hope that that will be helpful not only for us in drawing the lines, but also for the eventual siting authority, whether it be federal or state, by starting those conversations early um, and bringing these people into the process early. So now just to highlight a couple of findings from the National Transmission Needs Study. Again, it's a key input to NITSE designation. So this slide is a uh, executive summary. It provides sort of a visual map of the regional and uh, national findings of need. Just quickly, the need study does identify needs based on region. They are, uh, where possible, they align with reliability entities and transmission planning regions. So those who are familiar with those lines can probably pick them out on the map. Sometimes the data that we assessed was on state lines. lines. So you will see maps that have state boundaries instead of the boundaries of an RTO or ISO. Um, sort of, a, there are six, six, wait, six categories of transmission need here on the map. The filled in circles correspond to the color coding of where those transmission needs are. But sort of, you can see looking at this at the high level, there is a significant need for transmission development in nearly every region of the United States to address reliability and resilience, to address high consumer costs, and also to address congestion and constraints, which are only increasing over time. And this is sort of the same information, but it's a little bit easier to see the needs and the regions with this, this presentation. Um, we wanted to note here that 
where a circle is missing, DOE determined there wasn't enough evidence or there was an absence of data to be able to adequately assess where there's transmission need. So just want to emphasize that the absence of a circle does not mean that there is no transmission need there presently or in the future. It just means in this particular study, we didn't come to a conclusion that there was a need there. So just a couple of things to note here. Um, as soon as 2030, there will be a significant need for transmission deployment in the Texas region, the Plains region, and the Midwest region. And then by 2040, you can add to that large deployments needed in the mountain region, the mid-Atlantic region, and the southeast. And also by 2040, we are seeing the significant need for interregional transmission between nearly every region in the United States. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of regional congestion uh, key takeaways, not everything on the slide, but one is the changing landscape of transmission. And we talked a little bit about New England and all the investments that New England has made. Right now, New England has low congestion. But as you look out into the future, the demand is changing, the generation is changing, and we see significant increase in the, the transmission need landscape. And that's sort of true across all regions of the country. Also, because we're in the D.C. area, I thought I'd highlight that there are significant congestion and constraints in the eastern coastal mid-Atlantic region where we are right now. Uh, looking into the west, the plains, congestion in the plains is, of course, related to limited transmission capacity, but it's also related to the high wind generation output that we're seeing there. And similarly, constraints and congestion costs in the west are growing as the generation resource mix changes. I was not on the right side. Sorry about that. And then I put this slide in there just to uh, really highlight the, the relationship between the need study and NITSI designation. In the December guidance that we issued, we made a preliminary finding that NITSI designation may be particularly valuable where the 2023 need study shows a need for increased interregional transfer capacity. And this slide here has a graph, and this is interregional transfer capacity modeling expansion results for 2035. This is based on scenarios of moderate load growth and high clean energy growth, which are really is a, what we see as a re reasonable, potentially conservative estimate of the future power sector based on enacted laws and trends that we see moving forward. And just to quickly highlight sort of at the top there, uh, the most significant needs in terms of the total need for inter increased interregional transfer capacity, that first one at the top is the Mid-Atlantic Midwest, and that's sort of roughly the MISO PJM seam, looking at 156% increase. And then going down the seam between the Midwest and Plains and the Delta and Plains, so that's the, the full MISO SPP uh, seam, 175% and 414%. And then just to explain the some of the, the lower numbers, there are pairs of regions where the amount of interregional transfer capacity needed may not be that significant if you looked at the number standing alone, but when you compare it to how much exists today is sort of astronomical. So the Plains, Texas needs a 1200% increase by 2035. And so there really is that, that relative nature of what exists today. And that's especially true when you look at the three interconnections. There's very little today, and significant needed as we move into the future. And then I know we're almost out of time, but I'm gonna quickly touch on opportunities for state input and engagement, because of course that's why we're here today and what we really wanna hear from everyone about. So starting with NITSI, um, there are of course the formal opportunities for states to submit the same as any other interested party, proposals for where we should consider designating a NITSI, comments on the preliminary list of potential NITSIs, comments on our draft designation reports. As I mentioned, state policies are driving transmission needs. We wanna hear from states on those state policies. We, will, we would love to hear from states on all, of, all aspects of our NITSI process as we are going through. We also would anticipate states participating when we have public meetings and workshops during phase three. Uh, again, I mentioned we want to bring uh, affected landowners, we want to bring communities, we want to bring all the, the interested parties for this development to the table, and we would love states to be there with us as well, hopefully to assist with future siting within a corridor. And then we also, as I mentioned, NITSI designation focuses areas on the greatest areas of need. So to the extent that your state is included in a corridor, that is a tool that you can use to bring to transmission planners. You can bring to the developers themselves to encourage them to take advantage of DOE's financial tools, which should reduce the cost to ratepayers. Um, also, I just put in here encouraging deployment of advanced technologies. 
as a reminder that DOE, we're not selecting the solution to the need in these in these NITSIs. That is that is still an open question. And so uh, deploying advanced technology is something that we strongly support as well. This is uh, permitting authorities. I just do this one very quickly, but I um, just want to put in context because we've talked about site app and we're talking about FERC backstop siting. They're all under Section 216 of the Federal Power Act. 216A is where we have the need study and we have NITSI. And then, of course, NITSI designation is a prerequisite to triggering FERC's authority under Section 216B. And then Section 216H is where what Jeff was talking about, the site app process resides. And to explain the relationship quickly between those, a transmission developer who is developing within a NITSI and applies to FERC for a siting permit cannot also come to DOE for federal coordination under Section 216H because DOE has delegated that authority to FERC in those instances. But if a transmission developer is developing a project within a NITSI and does not seek a permit from FERC under Section 216B, they may come to DOE under 216H for that federal coordination. And then lastly, just a couple of other interactions between NITSI and state and federal processes. Top of this is a very important note that we really want to emphasize. We are not making a route determination for a specific transmission project, right? That is up to the siting authority. We are not endorsing a specific transmission solution. We are not selecting or preferencing a transmission project for any purpose. So it's still up to market participants, planning entities, uh, state and local authorities, tribal entities, potentially FERC to determine the solutions. And then also we have separate processes for, for the financial tools that are unlocked by NITSI designation where a developer must apply and be assessed under those separate processes. Uh, quickly, the relationship with FERC, we would like to coordinate with FERC to the maximum extent possible. Uh, we are conducting a, an environmental review for an area that may end up before FERC for a permit. We would like to engage and minimize redundancy and promote efficiency there. And then uh, I think an important one to make sure we highlight before we end, we are not disrupting or supplanting existing transmission planning processes. That's not our goal. We would like to complement them. So NITSI designation is an opportunity to identify areas of transmission need that may not be identified during the transmission planning process that exists today. So we talked a lot about interregional. I know there's a lot of discussion and this task force has discussed sort of some gaps in planning for that area. Uh, nevertheless, we are requesting information sort of top of our list. Has a project been submitted into a transmission planning process? What's the outcome of that transmission planning process? We're looking at RTO and ISO studies. So they're, they're absolutely important and valuable information that we're taking into consideration as we do our designation. So I think I spoke as quickly as possible, and I will stop there. Thank you so much. Um, can we turn the lights back up, and we'll start with any clarifying questions first? Clarifying question or comment? It's more of a substantive question. I mean, yeah, I, I'll, I'll hold off and let. Substantive start. questions. Okay. Does anybody have a, a clarifying question before we let uh, Commissioner Halk? Just, uh, you mentioned um, looking at how to reduce redundancies between your process and uh, what may get permitted at FERC, and also factoring in that we've got a state process somewhere in the middle here that could be doing this. Could you speak talk a little bit more about uh, specifically how you're hoping to reduce some of those redundancies that could increase costs for rate payers also? Yeah, so I think the to the extent that we are conducting an environmental review, you know, there are different ways the, in which you could define our action and what we're doing for a NITSI designation. But our goal is to, um, when we go through this and we put in this, all the resources and all the, the resources on our side, the resources on the side of all the communities, the developers, everyone participating in our process, we want to make it valuable. And so we design the resource reports, for example, that you'll see in our phase two of our document. They look a lot like what FERC has proposed in their rulemaking for their, their authority. They look a lot like what we have in our site app program, and we may revisit them as FERC gets to a final rule. So we're hoping to, to create something where the information is immediately valuable to FERC. Ideally, they could tear off of the environmental document that we are working on. Now, in terms of the, the timing, and I know you're talking this afternoon or after this a little bit more about it, we don't know what will go into FERC's final rule, so we'll be looking at that as well. And we may adjust what we do to the extent that there are there are greater efficiencies that we can we can develop as we know what FERC is definitely going to do. Commissioner Allen, thank you. And this question may be 
if it's unfair, I, uh, you can call me on that, but I, I think it's a fair question. Um, I appreciate the emphasis on, you know, complementing uh, regional, good regional uh, planning efforts. It makes perfect sense uh, to me, and uh, I hope it uh, works out that way. I also appreciate the emphasis on um, gaps between regions or, uh, you know, perhaps uh, states that have, you know, fairly robust holistic uh, uh, planning fr frameworks. Uh, there's another group that is kind of these potential, uh, I think of them as merchant projects, but they also kind of fill gaps in seam. So they actually kind of provide a bridge between uh, regions. And I have a difficulty reconciling the emphasis on, re you know, regional planning processes that aren't incorporating these uh, potentially merchant or other uh, projects that sort of pop up outside of that regional planning process with you know essentially uh, the need and the value of uh an emphasis that you're placing on these interregional uh, planning projects so can you help me to kind of reconcile what i perceive as attention yeah i can go first and jeff if you want to jump in but i think that uh you were talking about for example is new england has that long-term outlook a number of rtos perform these long-term studies they're very informational and they you know Merchant developers, for example, see that and they see this, okay, well, here's an area where the RTO itself has identified a need, but then they run into the interregional coordination framework and maybe they need to do the dual selection. It, it just, it's a very long burdensome process. And so maybe they think, well, there's enough need here. There's enough demand. We could be a merchant project. We could fill that need now. And the RTOs, you know, I can't speak for them, but I think they look at those projects as well and their sort of significant interconnection processes and studies and everything before those get integrated into their systems. And so I think there's a real opportunity there for us to sort of accelerate some of that in a way that maybe is not happening today. Yeah, that was, that was perfect. I mean, I, I think the, we are, um, we're not, as Gretchen mentioned, right, the planning process is a really important input, but it's not the only input, right? There's a bunch of other factors that we are are tasked with considering uh, under the Federal Power Act and things like that. But I, but I, I think to to Gretchen's point, right, we're not displacing the planning process. Our NITI corridor designation doesn't mean that a project's going to be built. It's sort of like operates wholly outside of the system, right? It will need to be interconnected. There, There is processes for that. So um, we're trying to balance those things to make sure that we're identifying the places of acute need where we can helpfully advance projects while also respecting and working with those planning processes. Commissioner Pridemar. The Mississippi and Louisiana commissions filed comments and one of the concerns that they had was that transmission developers would be allowed to select the NITSI location. Could you talk us through that? Yeah, so the original notice of intent request for information that we issued last May suggested uh, having transmission developers as the only entities that could propose where to designate a NITSI and why, and we changed that sort of framework entirely when we issued the guidance document in December. And we received, you know, February 2nd was our, our due date. We received robust participation and from a lot of different entities. So I think that that was sort of one of the things on the comments we received in response to the notice of intent is almost universal suggestion to not do it that way, to open it up. And so I think that that is exact, it's what we did and, and it seems to have already uh, yielded positive results. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that, you know, we had originally um, kind of proposed that that approach because we wanted to to um, to adjust for the lessons of the past. Right. When DOE first tried to implement this authority, it was very broad corridors and those ran into a lot of difficulties. So we wanted to make sure we had narrow, narrower areas that we were identifying. So we're identifying the communities that we need to work with. We're doing those things. But as Gretchen said, you know, universal impact was we need to make sure that a variety of entities can apply um, and can and apply is not the right word, can submit information for us to consider. Um, and so we've changed it to make sure that we can do that. And um, we will take on the work that DOE needs to do to identify what the right corridor is to address those challenges and needs. So we had identified a couple of issues to uh, collectively to provide feedback on. And um, the first issue is what assistance would be most useful to states from DOE in citing transmission, such as grants, technical assistance, 
and Chair Gillette was going to offer some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, that presentation. It's really informative. Um, I wanted to start with, um, you know, a recognition of a program that DOE has uh, currently, which is, um, uh, I'm going to mess up the formal name, but you, you offer states the ability to recruit fellows um, out of, uh, I think, your innovation office. And um, Connecticut has been the beneficiary of um, receiving several fellows placed with us that we were ultimately able to offer full-time uh, positions too. So um, I want to thank you for, uh, I want to thank the DOE for um, standing up that program. And I think it's a great model that could be carried over here. Um, in your presentation, you offered some um, uh, comments about grants and um, certainly this, this discussion topic contemplates the uh, extension of technical assistance to the states. Uh, and I definitely um, don't uh, have any negative things to say about that. I think that's a excellent approach to assisting the states. Uh, I will say, and I think um, this is probably across the country, all of our utility commissions are um, certainly mine. And I think all the Northeast at a minimum um, are continuing to continuing to experience challenges, challenges attract, I think the coldness of this room is like <laughs> really making my I mean, um, lack up here. But um, uh, so if I shake hands with anyone at the break and my hands are like uh, ice cold, I'm so sorry. Anyway, um, uh, we continue to have a lot of difficulty in attracting and retaining engineers and planners. Uh, and, um, you know, we've tried to be creative about it, partner directly with our colleges. So uh, when you get into the meatier topics um, that we're talking about here, uh, definitely um, the federal government stepping in and providing technical assistance to supplement um, some of those areas uh, where when we have had success recruiting in, in those job classifications, they're definitely younger folks who um, um, are, you know, fresh out of college and uh, can benefit from lessons learned um, at the the uh, national level. Um, I will say, however, uh, uh, you know, having five years of experience under my belt running an agency now, um, sometimes it's difficult to even uh, take advantage of free assistance. And uh, I understand that that sounds like an oxymoron, but um, if you're in a state that requires you to even enter in, into a contract for um, services that are going to be provided for free, and you couple that with a um, you know timeline. We've heard 120 days from um, Chair French, and uh, when you're when you're coupling that with the need to um, enter into contracts, we might even struggle to take advantage of technical assistance. So, um, in an effort to be creative about what that looks like, then um, in terms of you providing us uh, assistance. Um, with specific applications, obviously one answer is to take a step back and just focus on training um, our, our staff um, generally. Um, but if we're talking about uh, empowering us um, uh, further, an option that I was thinking through was uh, NARUC had produced a cybersecurity framework that has been updated several times um, since its initial uh, iteration. And the really great thing about that framework, in my um, opinion, is it doesn't seek to tell the states what the answer is or what that should be, but rather provides questions, um, uh, banks of questions by subject matter um, that almost allows us to put together, you know, to find, to you know, create your own destiny um, and uh, piece together by answering all of those questions, um, what the answer could be specific to our state. So uh, coming up with frameworks, banks of questions, um, even resources that allow us to compare um, pricing estimates or alternatives um, with real on the ground estimates um, or, uh, or actual data from other parts of the country. Uh, those are things that we don't have the time in a specific docket to research um, and uh, could, could benefit from even if we're not able to specifically engage you um, and your services on a, a docket. So um, again, uh, I want to thank you for um, that presentation for um, you know the the offer of technical assistance. You've definitely identified that that is a need for us. And I think we just are ships passing in the night sometimes about how to access that. So um, uh, thank you. And um, I'll turn the mic back over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the second um, 
area that we were going to provide feedback was on the consultation with states during the transmission needs study engagement and engagement on the NITSE designation process. And we're going to hear from uh, Chair Scripps first and then Commissioner Duffley. Sure. I'm going to try and um, strip out a lot of my comments. And I know that we're already into to break time, which is important to, to everybody. Um, first, Gretchen and Jeff, I appreciate the, the feedback, particularly in response to Chair Pridemore's um, question around the revamping the process and, and who is ultimately able to participate. I think that was an important change. Um, I also think, you know, the example that comes to my mind is, as one that's worked well is the, the MISO futures development process, uh, where it really was bottoms up. It um, used as the sort of core inputs, the results of state IRPs and statutory provisions in the states within the MISO footprint also included state goals and utility announcements, but at a discounted rate. Um, a state goal is not the same thing as a state law, and a utility announcement is not the same as what ultimately gets approved by a state uh, commission um, through the IRP process. I think the other pieces that that are are part of that sort of inherently are announced retirements, and particularly now, um, the the emerging load growth that we're all reading so much about. And then use that um, and, and overlay on top of that the existing transmission system and the projects, transmission projects that are approved and in development. And I think that can really inform uh, a lot of where we are and where we're going, uh, but also what's needed to do that, what's needed to get there. And that's where I think uh, a gaps analysis of, of what's missing within the transmission can really help to identify sort of where these corridors um, should be. Um, and by developing that robust set of inputs, including retirements, uh, generation additions, changes to load, uh, and all grounded in the results of state planning processes and statutory requirements, I think we're much more likely uh, to, to have these NITSIs, um identify places that are truly in the national interest. And the last thing that I'd say, and Gretchen, you mentioned this, the, the NITSI designation does offer some advantages. So I think there's just candidly, we're state regulators. Um, we're we're proudly um, protective of our state jurisdiction, but the, the fact that it opens up, for example, federal financing can be an advantage. And so I think understanding that while a NITSI is a prerequisite for uh, FERC's use of backstop authority, it doesn't automatically trigger FERC's backstop authority. And I think we're very interested, or at least I'm very interested, I'll speak for myself, um, in identifying the places where we can have access to some of those federal fi um, financing programs and funds, um, but without necessarily ceding our, our citing jurisdiction authority um, and to identify the places where, where you might get one but not the other, I think is of real interest. Commissioner Duffley. Okay, so I'm speaking for the Seabrook region and uh, I'm, I share your comment. I talked about the Seabrook region. I hope that's okay. <laughs> no, no, I was I was going to say I, I shared the sentiment of your comments. I think I'm getting too close, um, but I'm going to come at it a, a, a bit differently. Um, but because the NEATSI process is still somewhat an applicant driven process, even with your changes, once the preliminary list is created, I really urge you to reach out to the states and work with the states. In this engagement, DOE should determine, if it doesn't already know, to what extent the NAIR corridor has been vetted by the current transmission planning process within the region or regions, and identify all concerns a state or states might have with the proposed project, if the states obviously choose to engage with DOE. DOE should not just read the comments made by states, I encourage DOE, again, to actively engage with the states and work through potential solutions for any concerns and or reassess its determination if necessary. Um, I disagree with a comment earlier that collaboration does not lead to results. Collaboration under the right circumstances leads to the optimal results. Um, lastly, I have to put in a plug for, for my Southeast region. I will note that when Gretchen was discussing the future transmission needs on page 14 of her presentation, un unless I missed it, um, I did not hear that the Southeast uh, had any needs in the timeframes mentioned. Thank you. Well, thank, uh, thank you both for really um, providing incredible dense material very um, eloquently and uh, helpfully. Um, so we'll take a 10 minute break instead of 15 minutes, if that's okay, we'll pretty much be right back on time. Um, so we'll see everybody at
V27. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, apologies for the truncated break. Um, so we're moving now into maybe what I'll call our joint problem solving section where we've identified three meaty topics that we'd um, we'd like to engender some conversation about, um, and we're going to start with some opening remarks from some of the state commissioners and then hope to open it up uh, for a little back and forth before we move on. And I'll read each topic um, as, as we get to it, um, but there are three of them that we'll uh, tackle over the next um, uh, 65 minutes. So the, the first topic is how should state and federal siting reviews be sequenced and coordinated, including when there are concurrent state and federal siting proceedings, and what barriers exist for states to participate in federal siting processes? And we'll start with some comments from Commissioner Houck, uh, then Commissioner Allen, uh, Chair Throne, and Co-Chair Barrow, and then we'll open it up. Thank you. Um, so first, um, I want to state that California supports the efficient and well-planned expansion of the transmission system to maintain reliability, enhance economic efficiency, and achieve established energy procurement policies, such as energy diversity and renewable energy targets. Twelve months, however, may not be sufficient time for a state to approve a complex project. Um, however, at the end of that 12-month period, the state may have gained valuable knowledge and understanding of the complex project and may be in a better position to complete permitting in less time than um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's backstop par parallel process. California believes that um, FERC should include a memorandum of understanding or other agreement mechanism with states to agree to coordinate meaningful and efficient permitting while maintaining environmental and ratepayer protections. This process should be flexible to adapt to each project in each state's unique circumstances where either the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or the state may be in the best position to issue a timely permit. It should also provide preference for states to complete their review in a reasonable time, which for the reasons stated above may not be um, 12 months, but could still be more efficient and protective of ratepayers than um, a federal process. There are several opportunities to efficiently use information um, solicited during state processes by FERC, which may be more developed and vetted by the states uh, prior to initiating the formal backstop process. One potential example of this is in California, the Public Utilities Commission's consideration of environmental impacts and impacts to environmental and social justice communities. Additionally, FERC um, should consider um, recognition that its backstop siting process may be beginning after some federal agencies, such as land managers, and we talked about that earlier this morning, may have already initiated the NEPA process in coordination with states, and significant resources may have been extended in initiating that process, which may not mirror um, the backstop process. The transmission backstop Citing rule is unclear as to what FERC will do in regards to when the parallel process starts. Would it be a pre-filing process? Will there actually be permitting going on um, in dual parallel processes? And it's important to keep in mind that these processes are going to in potentially increase cost um, as applicants will have to be preparing studies, um, whether it's engineering, environmental, or legal reviews, for, to meet FERC's requirements as well as the state's. To avoid increasing ratepayer cost, it will be important to plan how a backstop process can efficiently use the materials produced in processes completed by other federal agencies and the states prior to initiating a formal uh, federal backstop process. While we're eager to see transmission siting and development completed efficiently, um, the California Public Utilities Commission, I believe similar to other state commissions um, and stakeholders face several challenges and potentially barriers to participating in a FERC backstop siting proceeding while fulfilling their own duties in a state siting process. 
State staff availability and resourcing um, could create substantial hurdles to state participation in a backstop siting proceeding. Sometimes the issue is as simple as noticing the correct staff as the project manager of the corresponding state application may be very different than the staff who normally um, participate in FERC proceedings. Staff time and consultant support for siting proceedings at the California Public Utilities Commission is normally funded through reimbursement of application fees, which would not apply in cases um, where we would be participating in a FERC backstop process. And this could require diversion of um, PUC funds and limit the PUC's capacity to use technical consultants to support any analysis in a FERC proceeding. In California, formal comments of the um, California Public Utilities Commission that would be presented at FERC have to be noticed and presented at a public meeting for commissioners to vote on. Um, this limits the opportunity of our staff to potentially review and provide meaningful um, feedback on FERC's proceeding documents while concurrently providing support to the same in-progress siting proceeding and other siting proceedings before FERC. So in short, it could create a resource issue. Um, California looks forward to continued engagement with the Federal Regulatory Commission, our state colleagues and other commissions, in finding more nuanced processes to efficiently site needed transmission rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. And again, um, implementing a project-specific memorandum of understanding coordination process could avoid some of these challenges, including reducing time and cost for two parallel siting processes. So thank you again for this opportunity to provide comment. Ms. Allen. Uh, and so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of focus in on the, I think the one significant issue that I have with, uh, with the proposal as, as it stands. And I think it kind of, aligns or overlaps with the concerns that were identified and highlighted by uh, the concurrence from uh, uh, Commissioner Christie. Uh, I, I generally feel uh, that uh, the pre-filing um, uh, filing, uh, and notices that are associated with that that occur when the application is, is filed is potentially going to create uh, uh, some, some confusion among landowners and stakeholders and uh, like when there are two parallel processes uh, and <clears throat> regulatory uh, authorities that uh, are potentially brought into to view. I'd much rather see uh, the uh, processes sequence, sequenced and the emphasis of anything that goes to essentially stakeholders and landowners and the like, if it is, does occur early in a pre-filing process, really be directing stakeholders Toward the state uh, processes, I, I I believe that the state processes have been grooved over many uh, decades. Uh, they are uh, inherently local in uh, character. The coordination between state agencies, anyways, is fairly uh, seamless, and um, <clears throat> you know there's always room for improvement. I th I think we will improve it go going forward, and I do believe the backstop th authority is a good thing to uh, to have. I, I, I do believe moving these uh, transmission projects is uh, indeed a priority. I just worry that uh, if if we uh, push too hard in parallel, that it's, it's actually going to create some complications that are going to undermine the longer term uh, objectives. Uh, so with that, I think I'll, oh yeah, just, you know, I have a, uh, <clears throat> a, a a comment that has been related to me, and I, I kind of appreciate it, was uh, from uh, one of the, the transmission companies we talked to in, in pre preparing uh, for this. Uh, you know, the, the backstop authority in, in my mind, and I very much agree with this, is uh, the kind of thing that you really do want to have out there, but but it's it's best when it goes unused or under underutilized and uh, and to kind of recognize and uh, reinforce that, that concept. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I would um, actually like to emphasize that, you know, concurrent proceedings um, are probably not ideal, uh, that uh, it's probably preferable to let the state and local entities uh, proceed first, and certainly in Wyoming's case and most places in the interior West, I don't think it's the state and local proceedings um, 
that are slowing down the process. Not that we are incapable of our own bureaucratic delays and duplication, uh, but I think the emphasis on understanding the local uh, lay of the land before you start is essential. Um, each state has its quirks. Wyoming has its own industrial siting program that's rather unique. I think um, Montana kind of has something like it, but not really. And um, it's fast. And it's a multi-agency coordination process where if you let them go first, they will gather all of the information that you need. Um, and in particular, in many parts of the West, and especially in Wyoming, um, there are endangered species issues. There are other uh, wildlife issues where our local agencies are likely to have much more expertise uh, than the federal agencies. And we pride ourselves on that. And I think that that is probably a common theme you will find across the West. Um, in addition, um, you know, the question asks what, what barriers exist uh, for states to participate. Certainly in the West, we're not familiar with FERC proceedings and resources are an issue. Uh, my PSC barely, we, we don't, we'd have to uh, probably get a new AG and, and more resources to truly participate in a FERC proceeding. But in Wyoming, we are very familiar with federal land management proceedings. And while I recognize the value of, of FERC being the lead agency, I would encourage um, and DOE being lead agency on, on any sorts of decisions, I would encourage the entities to coordinate with your local federal land managers and your sister federal agencies because uh, they, they do have the local expertise um, and probably have the community relations that will help streamline uh, whatever process we're in. Thank you. Thank you. What's your power? Um, I certainly will not be the outlier in anything that was just said. Um, a simultaneous pre-filing process that's going on while the state process is ongoing will be problematic. I don't think it will. I don't like I'm pretty sure it will be problematic. Um, the states and, and definitely Pennsylvania. Um, we agree that that um, efficiency and timeliness of processing needed infrastructure is very important, but um, we need time to do our own, do the jobs that we have to do. And if there is a pre-filing process going on simultaneously, one, it's gonna confuse customers, landowners, legislators, everybody. And it's also gonna be a drain on state commission resources. We do not have um, enough engineers, attorneys to um, participate in both proceedings at the same time. And it also will cause, uh, uh, it's more in the perception. It's gonna be a, a, a bit of a, a conflict of interest for state staff. If I have to, um, I'm presiding over a proceeding in the state at the same time my staff is participating in in the pre-filing process, um, that, that's all sorts of confusion and definitely a conflict. Um, I, I don't know if the current process um, where there's a year between the processes. I don't know if that's if that's the right answer, but I will say, please don't make it simul simultaneous. Um, uh, another point is that pre-construction costs for transmission lines can quickly go into tens of millions of dollars. And um, the more complicated the process is, that dollar figure is going to go up, and that ultimately is going to be paid by ratepayers. Thanks. 
wondering, um, others want to reflect on what you've heard, either for commissioners or other states? Um, Chair Phillips. I just want to say it's uh, pretty clear and ambiguous. Thank you. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> French. Well, maybe I don't even need to offer comment. <laughs> but I want to agree with all my colleagues um, and just mm -hmm. echo the, the my major concern is one that almost everybody mentioned, which is the confusion to landowners, customers, other participants, and having simultaneous proceedings. The number one, well, I don't know if it's number one. One of the top complaints that we always get is how difficult it is to engage in our proceedings as an individual landowner to understand our processes, which can be arcane and difficult for a lay person. I cannot imagine the complexity of layering over that, the understanding that there is a separate federal process going on on the same subject matter at the same time, and that they need to be participating equally in both proceedings. So um, I just want to make sure that's emphasized. Mr. Houck, and I guess I'm just curious as we go around you, if I identify the issue clearly of confusion and of things going on in parallel suggested fixes. I just want to underscore something that Vice Chair Barrow had said, um, the conflict of interest issue. If our expert staff are supposed to be um, objectively evaluating a project that's before us while being a party advocating for the state's position at FERC, it really creates um, a problem for, for our agencies to be able to separate those functions and get the best information to you as well as uh, meet the needs of our constituents in reviewing projects. Again, anybody want to offer potential fixes? Is it delaying the pre-filing process? What is it that you're thinking? You've identified, clearly put your finger on bunch of related problems of the going on two things in parallel. You have suggested solutions. Uh, Commissioner Howe, Commissioner Allen. I'll just refer back to my prior comments. I think some sort of a agreement with the states that recognizes um, how best to most efficiently get this done in a way that avoids some of the things we've talked about. And um, to the extent there can be um, sequential as opposed to parallel and looking at how this can work, but making sure there's a reasonable time frame to do that. Okay, I think we I forgot my order. Commissioner Allen, our mm -hmm. oh, throne. So, so my preferred response is I, I would delay the uh, the pre-filing um, process until after the 12-month the period, maybe 12 months plus the other 90 days that, that were contemplating as contemplated as a, a, a bridge period to essentially receive information from the state uh, processes. Uh, but absent that, I mean, it seems to me that some sort of notice, I mean, <clears throat> communications between the applicant and FERC isn't the problem. The, the problem is when there is communication to uh, stakeholders and uh, landowners and, and the like about these two parallel of processes. So that's that's the thing that concerns me most. If there's notice or if there's uh, ways of getting, you know, things off the ground at FERC by having the applicant contact and notify FERC, those may be appropriate steps. And they, they don't kind of flag the concern that, that I have. I share power. Um, the process just needs to be sequential. There's, that's as simple sure. as I can make, make it. Sure, Thrawn. And I'll be brief as well. I think the the uh, concept of an MOU with the states and and again, recognizing where the states have expertise and the federal agency may not uh, could also streamline the process to avoid duplication as, as well as conflicting results. Right. Thank you. We're moving on to the next topic. Okay. So uh, the next topic is what factors should FERC consider in its, back, in its backstop siting proceedings, including but not limited to state findings, um, impact to environmental justice communities, and cost recovery mechanisms. And we'll start with Co-Chair Barrow. 
um, Commissioner French, and then Chair Throne again. So Section 824PB3 through 6 lays out pretty clearly what, what uh, Congress um, expects. And I won't read those, but you're going to hear me repeat a couple of words from them more than a few times. So um, something FERC should consider in its proceedings are lease regret solutions. Um, the corridor projects, according to the statute, should significant, significantly reduce congestion, be consistent with sound energy policy and enhance energy independence. So FERC should look for projects that significantly reduce congestion persistently over a range of future scenarios. Can't just be fleeting congestion. Um, the, the studies are going to be key. Um, and, and also um, a holistic look at that congestion. Um, I, I truly, and just as an aside, this is me. I truly believe that generation should be allowed to compete with transmission. Um, we need to get to a spot where transmission is not the only tool that we're using to fix what ultimately is a resource adequacy problem. Um, so I don't know how much leeway there is for that, but it's just something to think of. Um, FERC should be looking at protecting all customers, um, ensure that Projects include benefits for customers on the low side of congestion, not increasing prices to such a degree. Um, I, let me restate that. Ensure that the project includes benefits for, cus for customers on the low side of congestion, not increasing prices to such a degree that it swamps the benefit cost ratio. Um, maximum Optimization of benefits. FERC should encourage projects that maximize benefits to consumers in the long term by mandating grid enhancing technologies for the NEETSI projects. Even if those, those um, grid enhancing technologies result in higher prices, um, they will move the line on the benefit cost ratio. And, and finally, minimization of impacts. Um, maximizing existing towers, structures, that's in the public interest, saves ratepayer money. The intent of facility maximization requirement of the requirement is to minimize impact. Sometimes the impact's gonna be necessary, and of course it shouldn't be avoided where there's a greater public interest that requires it but communities should not bear a disproportionate burden over time. The quickest way to endanger transmission build out as a whole um, is to convince the public you're not listening to impact concerns and, and um, by not looking to minimize impact and displacement. And I think if all of those things that I just mentioned are taken into consideration, um, there will be a lot less uh, opposition. Thank you. Um, Mr. French. Thanks. Yeah, I've got a, a few things I would suggest for consider in their proceedings to the extent they ever have to open any of these proceedings. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thought, and this is actually going to go back to the sequencing, uh, it's going to provide you some more support for, for going sequentially, is um, I think if if a state decides to withhold a siting permit and FERC decides that it needs to override that decision, I would suggest that FERC do so in the narrowest possible way and defer as much as possible to findings the state made in their underlying proceedings, uh, which hopefully concluded before the FERC proceeding. Uh, 
Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, Kansas must make a finding, and like many states, must make a finding uh, under our citing statute of both the need for the line and the reasonableness of the proposed route of the line. We in Kansas, and I suspect most states, actually spend most of our analytical time looking at the actual route of the line and considering various alternative routes uh, for specific segments and micrositing structures to reduce the burden on existing land uses. If a state is, in FERC's opinion, acting too parochially in looking at the need for the line, not considering regional and interregional benefits in a way that unreasonably impedes interstate commerce, I can understand the argument that FERC may need to step in and make a determination on whether the line is needed. But I would suggest that FERC could still defer to the findings of the state on the route of the line because it is their state's land that will be taken. And they should have better perspective on what route works best for their local land uses. So another reason why I think sequential processing might be beneficial. My second thought is that I really appreciate DOE's comments uh, that they aim to look carefully at um, planning processes in whether a, a NITSI or a corridor is established. Um, I think FERC should do the same uh, in, in granting or withholding a siting uh, permit. As I read the law and FERC's NOPER, it seems clear that DOE's designation of a NITSI does not automatically require FERC to grant a siting permit or find that a project is in the public interest under Section 216 um, or at a list of other standards it has to address. FERC still has a lot of discretion to grant or withhold a permit in making its decision. And I would suggest that FERC carefully consider whether the proposed project sits in a geographic region that already has a strong transmission planning process uh, FERC should ask whether the existing processes identified the project as a need. Were the existing projects able to be considered? Um, were they considered? Uh, if not, why weren't they considered? If the project was able to be considered and proposed into those existing planning processes, but it wasn't approved, I think I would urge FERC to be very cautious about granting siting permits and circumventing the existing planning processes which I think would carry some risk of undermining uh, the existing planning processes and the participation of stakeholders in those processes in the future. Now, the flip side of that coin is that if states and regions know that their regional and perhaps interregional planning processes could be scrutinized in a backstop siting proceeding, I would hope that would give them an incentive to ensure their processes are robust and worthy of the deference that I'm urging you to give them. So, the final thing I, I think I want, I don't know if this is something that I want you to consider in proceedings, but it's something I hope FERC will clarify whenever you wield your backstop authority. Um, this question referred to cost recovery mechanisms. Um, and I was a little intrigued by that. And I think it would be very helpful for FERC either in, in a, a rulemaking or within individual dockets to clarify what exactly you are granting if you grant a siting permit. My understanding is it would just be for um, the route of the line, the siting of the line. You are not granting a cost, cost recovery mechanism. You're not granting formula rate treatment. You're not granting interconnection service. Uh, you are not granting the use of an RTO approved cost allocation mechanism, unless of course the upgrade was originally planned as part of a regional plan with the, the cost allocation mechanism uh, attached. I think there is a lot of angst um, from folks about what uh, approval of a line through the backstop siting process really means. And I think it would be helpful for FERC to maybe um, set some folks' minds at ease and, and explain what the limits of that permit uh, actually entail. That's all I have, thank you. Chair sure, Throne. Thank you, I think I'm probably gonna give us back some more time, uh, given the thoroughness of my colleagues' comments. Um, I think, you know, it's important to avoid a backstop siting, but I, I think the um, use of it as a potential incentive or, or hammer, to use that term, um, 
you know, could could have some benefits, uh, but it needs to be coordinated with, you know, the regional um, issues. If if in the West we um, have really not resolved our regional differences, uh, FERC coming in um, may be necessary, but is likely to lead whatever to delay and litigation. Uh, so I think it's got to be the tool of last resort. And I think the, um, again, the importance of recognizing um, in a less populated state that there are impacts to siting, uh, whether they're landowner impacts or wildlife impacts is also important. And it's certainly the experience of, of Wyoming uh, that there's not an agency in the federal government that um, understands our um, our love of our wide open spaces. So I think if you can avoid getting yourself into that fight in the first place and rely on um, the regional discussions that are well underway in the West uh, to the extent possible, um, it, it will be more efficient in the long run. So others want to weigh in on uh, what you've just heard around what factors um, FERC should consider in backstop. Or any reactions from our FERC commissioners? Okay, loud and clear. Anybody else want to add anything that wasn't said before we move on? Mr. Allen. No, I, I just wanted to, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, support some of the, um, you know, the um, planning and coordination and outreach initiatives that were actually embedded in uh, uh, in uh, the proposed rule that, that uh, language. I, I think there are some changes there that relate to uh, the environmental justice communities that are adversely affected and uh, the uh, the outreach uh, stakeholder outreach uh, plans that need to be filed and uh, those sorts of things. I think those are positive. I, I think they'll hopefully inspire um, states to um, you know move in a, in a along a similar path. Um, but I, I do think that those are good and welcome considerations that have been included. Right. Okay. We're moving on to our third um, and last uh, discussion topic in this area, which is how does the FERC backstop siting process interface with transmission planning and cost allocation uh, requirements, uh, which somebody flagged before, uh, Chair Scripps and then Commissioner Duffley. So I'm going to start by saying that I basically want to adopt all of uh, Chair French's comments as, as my own um, on this, because I, I think he covered a lot of this, but maybe I'll um, try and address a couple things from the opposite side of the, the coin to, to unpack them um, before turning things over to, to Commissioner Duffley. So I, I think, first of all, I think there are a number of siting um, uh, or trans planning processes um, that are underway, and a lot of those carry uh, cost allocation um, approaches uh, that are approved in FERC tariffs. Um, or approved at FERC approved that are included in FERC approved tariffs uh, as well, particularly within the RTO regions. And so I, I would start there. I don't think we need to to recreate the wheel. And if the project has used the the planning process at an RTO level in particular, um, I think that um, FERC can simply use that as as the process. I don't think that FERC needs to have a separate process there. And I agree with everything that that um, Mr. French talked about in terms of. Chair French, I can never remember <laughs> whether how it rotates in Kansas. Um, uh, I don't know that that it needs to be sort of recreated. Um, I think in terms of when backstop siting is a, is a appropriate using a project that's been identified by an RTO planning process. Um, I, I I divide it in my mind into two buckets. The first is if the project is within a single state and is designed to serve within a single state, in which case. Um, I would defer almost entirely to the state's um, siting authority. Uh, if it's only serving that state, even if it's approved through a regional planning process, and ultimately um, the siting for that project, uh, the local siting authority is unconvinced um, within that single state. It's unclear to me sort of why FERC would substitute its judgment for, for the local siting authority for a single state project. 
um, for a project that went through the RTO planning process that covers multiple states. I think um, Chair French covered some of this uh, as well. There, there may be a role for backstop authority if the project is providing benefits to multiple states, um, but ultimately is hung up by a single state's refusal to, to permit through that state um, or a small subset of states. I think the planning and the cost allocation that are done through the RTO continue to, to apply to that project. Um, it is simply the siting authority and the backstop siting authority that um, that uh, FERC would be exercising. And uh, again, I think the, um, and then, sorry, and then finally for, for interregional projects. And this is a place where I think it's a little less defined in my mind, but where FERC may have a larger role. I've said before in this that no state can do interregional projects alone, um, that no single RTO can do interregional projects alone. And there is, I think, a, a pretty broadly shared sense that the interregional provisions in Order 1000 haven't um, been implemented as, as well as we all would have hoped when they were they were put in place, um, even if there's less agreement on, exa on exactly what to do about that. Um, but I do think that FERC has a unique role to play here with its, its national perspective, um, particularly given the historic challenges to interregional transmission development. I think there are still open questions on how those projects, the, the, the relationship, going back to the question here, um, how they should interface with transmission and cost allocation requirements. Perhaps that will be uh, addressed in the final rule. We're very excited to see it. Um, but I do think in those particular cases, whether they're um, developer proposed projects or projects that um, states agree on, even if there's not necessarily agreement between the RTOs, there's but there has to be some way of moving those projects forward. And I think backstop authority can play a larger role there. With that, I'll probably answer. Hey, thank you. Um, before I answer the question you just asked, I do want to go back to the sequencing issue and agree with Chair French that it should be sequential processing. So for the question at hand, uh, FERC citing NOPER does not specify how this backstop permitting will interface with transmission planning and cost allocation. Typically, First line is designated during the transmission planning process. Second comes the siting process. And then cost allocation either predictably follows or is already determined. Under the NEATSI process and FERC's backstop siting authority, potentially first comes the siting process from an applicant-driven chosen narrow corridor, and it's not clear how this chosen narrow corridor will interact with current transmission plan or the current transmission plan of a state or states or plan within the region, and how the cost allocation of that line will occur, especially in non-RTO areas. It's unclear how customers will be billed. Is it a subscription model in a non-RTO area? What is the mechanism that would roll the cost into rates if a subscription model is not used? And at what point is cost allocation decided? Further, the construction of a transmission line cannot be managed in isolation. The construction of the line will likely impact the system in positive, negative, or neutral ways. If a line impacts the surrounding system in negative ways or causes substantial affected system cost, how will the cost allocation be handled or can the project be modified based upon input from regional plans and from states? This task force has repeatedly discuss de-siloing transmission processes and sightings no different and should not be siloed from transmission planning and cost allocation. Um, I, I will mention, uh, Chair French mentioned the public interest determination um, that that is part of the process. And, and with that public interest determination, I think that the, the commission needs to look at like what is the ratepayer protection from the potential for paying for stranded assets. Another one would be, are the costs going to be roughly commiserate with the benefits? Those are another couple of public interest items to consider. Great. Other task force members want to either comment on that or add something you didn't hear that you think is important on this topic, subtopic?
So any any final um, comment on siting before we wrap up this part of our of our meeting? Talked about hit a lot of things today, and particularly in this conversation about uh, particularly avoiding um, uh, moving more, trying to keep things sequential as much as uh, possible. The theme that we've heard, I think, from the beginning of the task force about um, not siloing things and how do we think about siting in the kind of concept of not siloing from planning and cost allocation. Um, Can I just say one thing? What's up? I just wanted to say these these recommendations are, I appreciate them very much. They're very practical. They're very implementable um, things to think through as we finalize this. So I found this conversation really helpful. Thanks. Mr. Allen, quickly, and then we'll, uh, we'll move to wrap up. Yeah, I just <clears throat> wanted to hi highlight also um, the uh, um, concern with that. There's kind of the 12-month period, and then there's kind of a 90-day uh, bridge in there. To the extent that the uh, state has not essentially taken action, they haven't uh, closed uh, and concluded their proceedings, uh, that uh, that 90-day bridge um, may be a, a little bit clumsy. There may be ex parte concerns or other uh, things that kind of come into play that just kind of make it a, a less um, you know, um, efficient mechanism. And, um, <clears throat> but I think, uh, you know, uh, the materials and can still be passed, but uh, essentially the judicial elements of that process uh, will fall short. So I right, go ahead. On the, the 90 days that, that uh, Commissioner Allen's talking about, but it's not very clear. There, there's a. It leaves a lot of questions. The language in there about who um, we need more details. Basically, we need more details about how to participate in that in in the extra ninety days. Who gets to participate? Is it just the state? And do you mean just the siting authority? Um, uh, are there some um, conditions precedent before we can participate at that point? Um, if if the um, it, is it envisioned as like a one last chance? Let's say the state denied the uh, the application. Um, can we come back in? I mean, like just all sorts of questions. Right. So, uh, oh, chairs want to wrap up this meeting, your thoughts, and then we can move into talking a little bit about next steps. Hey, we've come to another productive meeting today. I will say that I did miss Commissioner Christie's remarks. I think he would have added to this conversation. So um, I did miss him today. Um, I have a hard time believing we're coming up on three years, Chairman Phillips, uh, with the discussion of the FERC's backstop citing NOPA today. We have, in my opinion, discussed most, if not all, of the major transmission issues in NOPERS currently with FERC. FERC's final rule on transmission issues, we're all anticipating that it will be issued soon. So I think that this is a really good time to reflect on the task force to date. Um, as you know, I've been supportive of the FERC and NARUC relationship and being able to discuss issues prior to the inception of the task force on transmission. Although a final rule has not issued, the changes made between the ANOPER and the NOPER indicate that collaboration is fruitful. A wise man once said, collaborate, do not litigate. Uh, so we, and we heard from uh, Nabrook, we heard at Nabrook yesterday, when sides are polarized, nothing is accomplished and progress is halted. 
With all of the challenges facing the industry today, this is not the time to not be communicating with each other. When parties work together, hear each other, and attempt to find common ground, bills pass, orders are issued without appeal, and rational decision-making takes place. I want to thank Sarah Fitzpatrick from NARUC for keeping us all on task. And I want to thank Jennifer Harrod and Heather Fresnel and Audie Keskar from the North Carolina Utilities Commission. I want to thank my fellow task force members for their dedicated work to date. I'm always amazed at the quality of people that decide to enter public service. In the first half of this meeting where we heard from the individual states about their states uh, is a fine example of that. I appreciate all of you. Lastly, I wanna congratulate Chairman Phillips for being named permanent chair of the commission. There is no better person to head and lead the commission during this time of rapid change. I'll turn it over to Chair French. Well, quick reflection, because whatever happens with this task force in the future, this is my last meeting. <laughs> uh, Going on three years. Um, for those of us that were that were appointed at the very beginning, we've reached the end of our term. Um, I will say when I volunteered to become a commissioner at the state of Kansas, I did not think this type of uh, proceeding and collaboration. It it never entered my mind that that was something on the horizon for me. Um, and I want to say how much I respect, uh, well, former Chairman Glick, uh, in particular for having the vision for this, um, but for all the FERC commissioners, um, and Chair Phillips for, for continuing it, but for all the FERC commissioners to, to show up and hear what the states have to say, I mean, that's unique, and uh, we respect you very much for that. Uh, to the state commissioners, some of you I've served on this for several years with you. I hope I've made some lifelong friends. Uh, there's a couple out in the uh, audience. <laughs> Chair Stanek, former Chair Stanek. Uh, Ted Thomas is there somewhere. Just look for the head above everybody else. <laughs> um, but it is it has really been an honor. And uh, I think we've advanced the ball forward. It, obviously, a lot of this were, were FERC initiatives. Um, but I think that they have benefited from getting the state's um, either urging or uh, having us pull them back a bit to to the reality of, of what we deal with in our states every day. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, it was a great meeting. And I too wanna just pause and think back when we started this early 2021 uh, and I think the commission was in a different place with the states. And and I think it was really important that Chairman Glick work together with then um, Chair Shalander. Is that? Shalander. Stanek, sorry, I'm mixing up who was in which role. Um, <laughs> Jason could have been doing all of them. But um, <laughs> uh, to, to come together, and I think it's been um, professionally productive. I do think I was speaking to a regulator in the Mid-Atlantic after our NOPA came out. She said, well, I'm very worried about some of these prescriptive things in this note. And I said, oh, my gosh, if I had my way, I'd been way more prescriptive. Uh, but I sat around with all of these people in the States and they um, helped me to understand why why we needed to, to compromise on different things. So I think it has been professionally productive. And I've also made a lot of friends, got to spend time with old friends and also, um, you know, met new ones who, who I hope will continue to stay in touch. So thank you. Just reeling from being called old by, <laughs> by my long-term friend, Commissioner Clements. <laughs> um, no, I, I want to add uh, my thoughts, uh, Chairman Phillips, and congratulations to you as well. Um, the, you were reflecting on this as our eighth meeting, and, and that caused me to start thinking back to where we were in, in 2021. And I think it's in some ways appropriate that we started the meeting with fire alarm tests since we started the uh the task force with masks on and um for and it's you know so we've come a long way together um and the relationship as as has been talked about has not always been sort of as perfect as i think probably commissioners on both sides um would have liked um and to be clear we have different jobs um we have different responsibilities and um and i think the most important 
for the most important result of, of the last three years has been a forum where we can uh, exchange ideas. I think you've seen the diversity of the states and the regions. Uh, we've also seen the diversity within FERC. And I think those are our strengths and the, the range of ideas that has been brought forward and discussed and thought through, uh, I think is is really sort of the most important thing that we've accomplished so far. Um, but on a personal note, the the bonds of friendship um, that I am fully confident will will continue many years and decades into the future um, are, are even more so. Um, our system of cooperative federalism that's really sort of at the heart of the Federal Power Act requires both of us, FERC and the state commissioners, uh, to be at the table in addressing these. And as we look to the future, and what's needed for transmission or in tackling other issues around resource adequacy or uh, maintaining the reliability, um, even as the energy transition continues, I think we're going to need to continue to work together as states and the FERC. That'll require open lines of communication and an ongoing dialogue, particularly given the overlapping and at times increasingly blurred lines of jurisdictional authority. Um, but I think this forum um, has provided a framework for doing exactly that. And um, sort of whatever the future of this forum is, I, I hope that that uh, ongoing relationship and the open lines of communication continue. And then I'll just say, I, I'm, we have 10 state commissioners today and and two FERC commissioners in, in person. I, I know that Commissioner Christie would like to be here as well if, if he could have been. And over time, we've obviously also had uh, former Chair Glick and former Commissioner Danley and seven other uh, former state commissioners. And um, I'll just say I am grateful to those colleagues on both sides of the state divide, uh, as well as the talented staff in Michigan at OMS and uh, certainly at Nehruk with Sarah before her, Tanya and Jennifer. I've learned so much from all of you, and uh, I come out of this a better commissioner for the state of Michigan and hopefully able to contribute in some ways to the national dialogue as well. Appreciate that. So this is... My first meeting with the task <laughs> force, <laughs> but I I have uh, for years now been a fan of the concept of this task force with the federal government and the state government, state uh, commissions working together. Um, even uh, if the topic is not transmission, you just pick the topic, that kind mm -hmm. of collaboration is useful. And from what I've seen from this task force is that all of the members show up, they do their homework, they roll their sleeves up, and they get it done. I mean, they 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 leave all the baggage uh, where it needs to stay, and just they get the work done. And that is commendable. Um. It's hard to have reflections after, well, I guess my three-hour reflections, <laughs> not three-year reflections. Uh, I, I do want to uh, commend the work of this task force. I want to thank uh, Sarah in particular for uh, getting me up to speed uh, as as much as she could under the, the short time frame that, that I had to become involved. Um, also congratulate Chair Phillips uh, Wish Commissioner Clements well, um, Miss Commissioner Christie. Uh, but I also want to say on behalf of hmm, the Western Western folks uh, that we do appreciate you uh, participating in our various Western meetings. Uh, we want that dialogue to continue. I think we we all have the same mission. Um, sometimes we might not agree on the how. And we have our own, you know, specific uh, local interests. But uh, if California and Wyoming can sit together at the same table, I think we can continue <laughs> FERC state uh, cooperation. And I, I think it's it's beneficial to all of us in implementing our mission. Thank you. While I was very anxious to join this uh, task force from its inception, I wasn't able to, but I was glad I got to get in anyway. And maybe it was my initial motivation reflected by New York arrogance, that we were big, we were bad, and we were building transmission, and we had four PPTN projects in the ground with steel in the air, and now we're all energized. And I thought that that was going to be 
we could show you something. But what this has showed me is that the great diversity of our country, we are not the same. And uh, what will work for us will not work for you. And uh, But one thing has also been very clear, particularly in the issue of transmission and how we pay for it and where it goes. If we do not share that with our rate payers and citizens in the most transparent way possible, we will come back to bite us in the end. And uh, what, uh, again, I have learned from that is that because we do it doesn't mean everybody know we did it. And uh, I think that is a, a great lesson, and, and I hope uh, a, a bellwether moving forward. Uh, again, and I also, God bless uh, those ISO founding fathers that gave us just one ISO in New York State. <laughs> <laughs> So um, thank you. This has been really just a tremendous opportunity for me personally, and most importantly for California and the West to be able to share our views directly with FERC commissioners on a vast array of transmission issues within the context of this unprecedented joint federal state task force. Um, I'd like to convey my gratitude to each of you, Chair Phillips, and congratulations, um, Commissioner Clements, and your colleagues who are not here. Um, for taking the initiative to establish this task force. Um, I wanna thank co-chair Duffy and uh, former co-chair Stanek uh, for um, their leadership. Uh, I wanna thank uh, my predecessor from California, um, Commissioner Rechtschaffen, who was one of the initial task force members and who was a, and still is a great mentor to me. And of to our staff that have supported me in this effort, we have a tremendous um, talented staff at the PUC who have provided so much support for me and all of the work that they have done over the years with FERC. So I wanna thank them. Um, I also wanna thank each of my colleagues on the task force, um, both current and uh, past. I have learned so much from each of you and just echo um, Commissioner Howard's statements that um, being able to learn and engage firsthand on the differences and similarities that we have. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that and how much that um, is going to assist me in doing my job as a commissioner. I also want to thank Jennifer Murphy and Sarah Fitzpatrick for all of their support. Um, and they've just gone above and beyond for all of us. Um, so I want to ask uh, the FERC commissioners, as you deliberate on the final rule, um, you know, and, and again, appreciate all of the ability to have these conversations with you. Um, California urges you consistent with the original charge for this task force to adopt policies that will facilitate development of the most efficient and cost-effective transmission projects, including new approaches for enhancing transparency and oversight of transmission spending. To that end, California has championed FERC's proposal from the ANOPER back in July of 2021 for almost three years. Um, for the establishment of an independent transmission monitor, which you've heard me say, I think maybe at every one of these meetings, I've had to mention independent transmission monitor. And um, we've frequently reiterated our support for the increased use of competition processes to procure transmission projects. And I would encourage you um, as this engagement with state and FERC commissioners moves forward that there be an opportunity to have this discussion on competitive processes. So, um, with that cognizant of this moment in which significant investment is being channeled into transmission to build the grid of the future, um, we're hopeful that the final rule for issues will help ensure that ratepayers get the most bang for their buck. And California is particularly concerned that um, we're FERC to adopt either of the proposed ROFRs that competition for transmission infrastructure in the Cal ISO and throughout the country would effectively be eliminated. And we would view this as a regulatory step backwards and a terrible loss for California ratepayers who would lose out on the considerable and proven cost savings from competition as demonstrated in the Cal ISO over, over the past 11 years. California commends FERC um, for its willingness to engage in this comprehensive public inquiry and immensely appreciate its having had a seat at the table these past three years to truly engage with you. And again, thank you. And I will turn it over to my colleague. Uh, uh, 
So uh, uh, thanks. I've already congratulated uh, Chair Phillips, but uh, I'll thank him for um, stepping up to the plate. I uh, really appreciate that. And of course, there are too many other people to kind of thank. I, I think, uh, like Chair French, this is probably uh, uh, my 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 last ch chance to meet with the group. So um, you know, indeed, I'll I'll miss you. And I, I was glad to see a couple of the former commissioners that were participating show up. Uh, so I can, uh, you know, thank them personally and uh, and uh, give my goodbyes. But uh, yeah, the the support group was just amazing. I won't go through the names, but it really goes back to the region too. I mean, I've I've relied heavily on ISO New England staff and state committee staff, the NESCO staff, and others. I mean, one thing that I found really valuable about about this process, apart from you know just an, the opportunity to engage with work was it really took me outside of my siloed kind of view of things from the state level. Um, NARUG, I think, um, uh, asked us all to take a regional perspective, and that was not an easy thing to do. We really had to kind of grow ourselves and educate ourselves. And when you uh, combine that with the experience of working with uh, other regions around the country, um, it was, you know, it's truly fascinating, and um, yeah, it was uncomfortable. Uh, um, I, I think uh, there it really did require a heavy lift, or at least it required a heavy lift on my part. I can't speak for my colleagues; uh, they're so uh, in, capable and intelligent that it probably wasn't a heavy lift. But um, <laughs> for, for me, this was a, a, a real challenge, but I enjoyed every every moment of it. I did want to kind of throw a couple ideas out there. Um, you know, we wanted to reinforce the uh, uh, notion of a, a regional focus when the states are involved. I think stepping up out outside of the uh, narrow state view is really important. Really appreciated the, uh, the initial focus on transmission topic and the fact that there was something that was so important happening at the uh, national level that we are included in. I do feel the states should be you know, a collaborating partner in, in uh, trying to craft where we uh, where we go from from here. Uh, I think there are a couple topics that'll uh, contribute. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll just uh, sort of end by saying that the topics that you know I think are are, are worth considering. I am very interested in the interregional uh, transmission. I think there. It's not just coordination that needs to uh, occur, but I, I think the the planning processes between regions and between states that aren't within uh, regions really need to synchronize, probably in terms of time, scope of benefits, uh, how they uh, view, um, you know, the cost allocation challenge, which is always very formidable. And uh, the other uh, topic that I, I think think uh, is on my short list of things that I, I would like to see progress on is uh, what I'll call intertie optimization. That's the term that Brattle uses. Um, I, I think they make a very compelling case. Is there, uh, that's an area of low hanging fruit that I think that um, you know the states and FERC can work together to, uh, to uh, provide repair benefit. Thanks so much. Well, thank you all. First of all, I just want to thank everybody for the very kind words. I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Commissioner Clements, um, who throughout this whole process always brings her ready to dig in sleeves rolled up uh, attitude to everything that we do, FERC, and, um, and that's that's invaluable. Commissioner Christie and all the other commissioners um, from FERC who participated. Thank you. I want to I want to thank all of the state members. You know, there's a lot of stuff I have written down here. I'm just going to say this. This is special. And, and I want you to know how special it is. Because when you look around this country and the way that we talk to each other, communicate, not just work colleagues, but neighbors, we sit at this table. You literally don't know who's an R or a D when they're talking. All you think about is that folks are trying to do their very best, communicate for their region, and to do the work of our country. I'm reminded of wise words that someone said, you know, there's no such thing as a red state. There's no such thing as a blue state. There's only the United States of America. 
And that's what we represent here. And I'm extremely proud to be a part of this group from the beginning when we pinned that letter and we said we need to do something and we've done so much. Ms. Liz, before I stop talking, um, I want to recognize staff. I want to recognize Nehruk staff. Um, and please, folks have called your name, but stand up. Stand up, Nehruk staff, please. <laughs> I also want to recognize FERC staff. Please stand up, especially Karen Hertzfeld. Please stand. And we got DOE here. We're not going to forget about them. DOE staff. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, look, and I also want to thank Dr. Rob, who's done a fantastic job. Please give him a round of applause. And with that, I will shut up. And this meeting is concluded unless you have some final thoughts as the moderator. We are done. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Be safe. I didn't notice that there was somebody to my left uh, that had uh, moved in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> Call it a wrap, right? Call it a wrap, yeah. yeah this is Jonathan Gap. Yeah. 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 Yeah.